hello. Uh, this is Ian McKellen, uh, welcoming you to the cast audio commentary of The Fellowship of the Ring. Welcome uh, to the DVD. Welcome. Okay. And for the next three and a half hours, uh, we'll be remembering what it was like uh, to film and contribute to Peter Jackson's movie. Strap yourself in. It's going to be a long ride, but I tell you what, it's going to be enjoyable. It'll be bumpy. <laughs> I feel it in the earth. It's pretty captivating when it's a, a complete black screen. Black screen, yeah. I like it that it doesn't say um, a Peter Jackson film. Uh, and I think it's a, a point of some pride um, uh, from Peter that he doesn't put his name right up at the top. It's, it's Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. A lot of people don't realize that the Lord of the Rings is Sauron. Who else could it be? He didn't make all the rings. He made the one ring, personally, which rules all the others, the ones that were given to the dwarves, to the elves, to mortal men, and so on. But he made the one ring. There was one point when uh, Gandalf's voice uh, was going to be telling the story, and uh, I, I made a plea for that. Um, I think I was told, oh, Ian, you've got enough to do in this movie without doing the prologue as well. But uh, I'm not sure when you watch it whether you could guess that this was uh, Galadriel or, or you might recognize uh, that it was Kate Blanchett, which is not at this point quite the same thing. There was some question whether it was actually going to be as long as it is uh, in the film as well. I'm glad they kept it at this length. Yeah, it's essential, isn't it? It's, you have yeah. to show how important that ring is. And lacing it with the map is just... Right. Brilliant. That was one of the things I was actually look, looking forward to the most is seeing that map on screen. Here we go. Hugo's coming up now. Hugo weaving. Hugo's well versed in uh, in battle now. He sure yeah. is. He's the had Matrix. Some practice. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, I remember when we got to New Zealand and during the uh, the prep stuff, and Peter showed us the animatic. Those yeah. sort of storyboards that were um, made as a little film with, with, you know, and he had hired actors to do That's the right, voices yeah. and there was music on it and everything. I, finally, I mean, I'd read the prologue to the book like four times and in the screenplay three times and it just, I don't know, for some reason, it's like my brain doesn't work. I just didn't understand it. When I saw it visually, it, it, uh, it was the first time that it sort of made, the world made sense to me. Mm. Yeah. Just as you're beginning to be reminded of Monty Python uh, epics, you know, the semi-religious language uh, of t Tolkien and the uh, sense that uh, actors are I impersonating the fate uh, of, of the world. Uh, suddenly, Peter pulls out a shot. Uh, it might be a close-up or it might be a, a massive shot of uh, soldiers uh, meeting their doom. Uh, and and uh, what's happening is uh, Peter is defying you to, to mock and... and uh, as gently in that way of his uh, grabbing hold of the audience's attention as you might get hold of someone's wrist and saying, oh, come on, come on, trust me, it's going to be worth it. That's why uh, I like the prologue, that uh, it, by the end of it you are within the world and, and you want it explained better and, and more deeply and... Uh, then, of course, your emotions are, are, are going to be involved. And, of course, once the director's got an audience's emotion, uh, then he's got uh, their attention. This, one this um, narration, which is actually hard to speak over because it's so brilliant, but um, the, it was originally written for, for Frodo to do, and I'm so glad that they changed it for That's Kate because it's... In, in some ways, it's so much more relevant. Mm. Yeah. Well, for an elf who's been around for thousands, thousands of years. Thousands of years, she would have known she was all there of this. When it was Absolutely. Happening. Yeah, yeah it would have ruined it if you would have done it because then there's no it jeopardy. Any, it's it like, doesn't make any sense. Frodo clearly makes it because he's going to talk about the history of it afterwards Absolutely. once he's gone through it all. Just because you write about something or you read about something, you don't necessarily have to show it. In fact, very often what you don't see is far more effective, frightening, suggestive, erotic, than what you do see. Sometimes it's vital. 
You talk about the ring slipping off Isildur's hand, goes down into the water, that lovely shot of the hand coming down, but you don't know whose hand it is. It would take too long to explain that it's found by the two hobbits, because Gollum, of course, is a hobbit. But it's Diagol who finds it. And, um, Gollum says to him, what's that? He said, that's, I found that. I want it. I want it. My birthday present. I want it. And he kills him. Oh, look at that shot. I love that. That's Gollum. so great. That is straight from the harbour. Yeah. Riddles in the dark. When he turns and his hair catches the light there, it's just mm. attention to detail. I think Gollum looks amazing in this, this sequence. Mm. I, I mean, I remember reading the book uh, for the first time and um, reading The Hobbit when I was about 14 or something, but I remember Go and this Gollum is perfect, you know? I mean, when I saw that, I thought, you know, that was just a tiny taster and it was just such a tease, perfect tease for it because he's such a sort of wretched and withering and sorrow sorrowful kind of being and I just I remember seeing that thinking my word and also you know Andy Serkis what, what an incredible job he did I remember thinking talking of Gollum I remember seeing Andy Serkis cough up the ring like um, as Gollum it was kind of it was just unbelievable the transformation that the guy made to, to actually like <laughs> he did this whole retching sound for Gollum and it was unbelievable brilliant just that bit there, I remember when they filmed that, and uh, Ian Holm uh, had that kind of facelift. <laughs> oh, they, they taped his face back to, right. to, to make him look younger. It was great. <laughs> it looked great. Oh, is this an extra added uh, map bit that wasn't included? I love it. I absolutely love anything oh, with it's the in, maps. Oh, it's in three dimensions as well. Yeah, it's cool. Oh, fantastic. Hobbiton. There we go. Show. See, it kind of shows how big Middle Earth is. Oh, that's yeah. actually really smart to kind of do a bit of an... It's good. People. And how big the Shire is, you yeah. know, it's not just a village. Yeah, yeah. that's one thing in the film, when when you saw it without some of that stuff, you, the Shire looked like it could, was just as big as, you know... As Hobbiton, mm. maybe. Interesting. The original title for Fellowship was over the map, and... Uh, oh, nice. Oh, dot, God, dot, God dot, yeah. Dot, 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 three dots. <laughs> <laughs> oh, of course. And there's Bilbo. Oh, is he drawing, writing letters now? There and back again. I remember Elijah was uh, taught calligraphy for a while in New Zealand, weren't you? That's right. So oh, you, yeah. you really came on leaps and bounds, man. Thank you, man. I was really, very impressed by that. Very, very good. <laughs> oh, that was cool. Did you see the shot of the hobbits? Yeah. In relation to the yeah. oxen? Oh, I wonder if they put the shot back in of Sam gardening. I was so... I really wanted a shot of Sam Gardening. Oh, yeah? And we didn't do it originally, and then when we went back to do reshoots sort of six months later, uh -huh. they added one shot in. I bet, it, I bet it's in here. Oh, is oh this, uh... there's Percy the Pig. He stayed in my hotel room for a <laughs> Really nice guy. Oh, he's, um, he, uh, he's a lighting guy. Yeah. Oh, that's right. I think Ian Holm was just the perfect choice for Bill by Baggins. In fact, I can't think of anyone better. There's uh, Zoe. Zoe? Yeah. One of the uh, people that were. She was. Out. She set the tone for the work ethic for everybody on the movie. She I don't know, I don't so know that hard, man's so name that, that she was talking to, but he was the quintessential hobbit. Yeah. For all of the hobbit sequences that we had. Is that, that's Unbelievable. That sound right? And of course, at this point, the audience is introduced to the idea look at that blue sky and the, the bright colours here that each. Episode and the and the story is is, is has its own colour and, and the colours here are, are bright and green and, and yellow and uh, sunny. Hobbits like fresh tilled. This is in Hamilton, which is probably one of the most uh, special times that, that I had doing the movie. Just I mean, look at the place; it's like paradise. We stayed at the. Do you, do you remember the name of the hotel we stayed? I don't at? remember the name of it, but that was my favourite place favorite that we hotel. ever stayed I in New Zealand. Know. We should give them a plug. We should find out. Although it did have a lot of mosquitoes, remember that? Yeah. Did you end up moving? Oh, are you out talking about that uh, no, bed and I, breakfast? Ian did. You uh, stayed because there. of the mosquitoes, and I ended up in Ian's room. Hang on, here we go. Here's the money shot. Who's that? Who is this shady character hidden behind? What? He's up. Oh. oh. He was in Deep Impact. Yeah, he Are you was. sure? You can't tell from this, but there, there was a, a, a wind blowing, uh, and uh, that hat was a bit of a problem. 
having been a part of the production and yet not really having been a part of Hobbiton, I just, when I first saw this, I just was like, isn't this just the place everybody wants to have grown up? I remember thinking, this is just such a beautifully safe and happy environment. Very much like New Zealand, I have to say. When I return to New Zealand now, I kind of feel like you're returning to Hobbiton. Goosey Goosey Gandhi. What a oh. great introduction mm. to our character. Oh, it's fantastic. I think Ian had a great time in Hamilton as well. How, just hanging around the Hobbits and him being the only wizard. There's Mr. a Elijah bit in this off. shot that I don't know how they did it though. Well, you see both of you together there, just just before that shot. Really? Yeah. I hear it's going to be a That's a, a forced perspective shot. How far behind are you? Um, I'm about two feet behind. Right. And the size of the... Um, of the pole of, of the cart mm -hmm. was different from my side than it was for his. Right. Weird. Look at that, that's stunning. Now, you can't tell from this that, um, um, that, that, that <laughs> there was an idea of Fran Walsh, or, or was it Philippa Burns, uh, that uh, Gandalf should have um, just given up smoking. Uh, I think they were a little bit worried that um, New Line or the censors or... or People who don't like smokers were going to object to the number of uh, characters that who smoke in the movie, and of course uh, Gandalf is a principal one, and uh, we're not altogether certain what weed it is he's putting into his pipe in the 60s. It was quite clear uh, that it was um, some uh, hallucinogenic uh, weed. Um, uh, and so Gandalf had just given up smoking, and, and, and all the scenes in the cut uh, involved him um, not smoking, but... Um, Sucking toffees, so all his all his dialogue came through um, sucking of um, caramel candy, and then I think we did another version with the pipe, and uh, that was the version that that won through. I I rather liked that that idea. It was a little bit cheeky. It it uh, it was acknowledging that the world's moved on a little bit since the the uh, books were written. Uh, and and um, there was a nice point when sitting with uh, Bilbo um, before the, the night before the party, um, Gandalf gives in and, and and has his first pipe for a long time. Uh, and then in the um, Council of Elrond, uh, the toffee bag made a reappearance because uh, that was an occasion which uh, clearly one Rivendell was a non-smoking. Uh, establishment and uh, so Gandalf had to go back to his toffees. That's all gone. Those mouth movements that he has <laughs> are, are <great>. unbelievable. <laughs> Brilliant. I remember feeling like we were a big traveling circus when we showed up here. It was like <laughs> yeah. you know, 4.35 in the morning just as the sun was about to start coming up that sort of pre-dawn light and, and we show up at the set and just beyond the hills of what you can see in the Shire you, there were 50 trucks and huge tents set up where all the you know these little hobbit kids were getting their feet put on early in the morning and you just sort of thought wow man we're it's like a big traveling yeah circus this little guy with his face as he reacts to seeing the uh the fireworks bust out of the back you know the kids this is just so peter and fran this moment for me this is like only they could have brought this in you know it's just isn't that fantastic it just warms your heart that bit and this guy loving it, and then, look. I love that. Those colors. I remember they were doing the, um, the digital, Digi grading. digital grading. Yeah. And uh, I walked in, and, and they were still for ages trying to figure out the, How green, uh, the how green. yellow, yeah. They, they could not find the right green. Because they wanted it to look real, but also but brilliant. But it started to go all brown, and mm. they couldn't mm. figure it out. Amazing. I remember feeling really passionate that they had to get... That I want. I needed them to get that right. Oh, <laughs> like, absolutely. As a just as an audience member, like I, the Shire has got to be so lush and so green and so the first but so real. Were really, were really brown. Well, it, but it also it looked fantasy, and mm -hmm. it's like to me, I didn't want it to be a fantasy. I wanted it to be a history, mm -hmm. and so you know, the Shire. I wanted it to just be natural. Totally. We're working with Ian home on this couple of days, whether we were together or not. Uh, was two of the happiest days of my professional life. I, I've been an admirer of his since I, I saw him play Henry V at Stratford-upon-Avon when, when we were both young. Um, 
I, I certainly marked him down as, as um, the greatest actor of his generation on stage. Against all the odds, you know, a, a noticeably small man, and these things matter in, in the theatre, but uh, his inner strength was so huge uh, that his uh, physicality uh, was irrelevant. I think this is one of Ian Holmes' great film performances, you know. It's very daring performance. It's, it, it risks uh, being thought to be too melodramatic in, in that he, he's, he, he shows an awful lot on his face and uh, draws attention to the fact that it's an impersonation of the character. This isn't a documentary, this is a bit of storytelling, and uh, Ian sets, sets the, the tone for that. Ian would tell you himself, and, and I was privileged to, to hear it during the course of these uh, working with him, his approach to acting. He makes every take, and there may be many takes of any scene, and he has a score, uh, makes every take different. Not willfully, he just goes with it and feels it in the moment. This is why he always looks so fresh presents the whole kaleidoscope and detail uh, of the character and, and lets the uh, director choose what he wants. And, and so uh, an Ian Home performance doesn't exist until the director's decided what it should be. It's a very, very generous way of, of acting and uh, takes enormous risks, of course, uh, because you risk making a fool of yourself. Um, I'm a little bit more careful. <laughs> it's great. He's so outrageous, Ian Home. <laughs> I love what he did with Bilbo. And the, one of the quietest, most gentle men you'll ever meet in your mm. life. I remember begging him to, for, not begging him, but asking him to autograph my you book. You begged, stop it, you did. <laughs> Pleading, sort of shamelessly, guilting him into uh, signing my book. And he wrote something great like, you know, Sean, at last we've... We finally met. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't hear about mine. What did he say? I gave, him, I gave him my book, uh, left it in the trailer, and um, I, evidently he didn't know it was mine, so I got my book, my book back, and it said, um, uh, all the best. <laughs> you know. Yeah, you know. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> well, he, he left you bag end. He leaves you, uh, you know, wealth and riches. What else do you want? So I, I had him sign it again. I was actually really nervous to ask um, Kate Blanchett. Mm. It was uh, you and me, Dom. Remember? Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember. So I don't think I was as nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I just ran in. Sign it. Stop. You know, my dad's been confused for Ian Holm twice, two separate occasions on I holiday. I can see that. Oh yeah, I can see that. Are you Ian Holm? I can definitely see that. A much younger version. Yeah, yeah. That's incredible. Just amazing how quickly he changes, kind of mood and emotion and stuff. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. I like what Ian is doing with his his body language, his posture. I mean, he's really like this big giant yeah. wizard in this room, and it's so not his own body frame when you see him. I mean, he's, mm. he's a delicate guy. Thin, sort of stretched. Oh, that's fine. So do I. It's one of my favorites. Yeah. Butter scraped over too much bread. Toast. Toast. <laughs> I have some toast. What was that? I think it was bread, actually. A toast? Is it time for 11? Here's to Sean. <laughs> this, yeah. this scene, oh, one of my favourite moments from the whole movie. It's like the quiet before the storm, that complete bliss of just enjoying a smoke after a meal and then Gandalf blowing a, a huge ship through that ring. It's just fantastic. Such a wonderful idea, straight from Tolkien and so delicately managed. All these pyrotechnics and, and the smoking are, are so believable uh, that you know you're in very, very safe hands for, for the telling of this story. And I, I think that's what's very ingenious about these, about these Hobbit and scenes is that you know it's going to be all right, but there's a storyteller here who's going to use every device of modern filmmaking and put it at the disposal of telling a, a story which is going to get increasingly more fascinating. Okay, there's a there's a few notes about the scene, by the way, for anyone. Yeah, like watching. they made us do a week of uh, of of dance and they rehearsals, and they didn't put they didn't leave it in the movie. Much. Billy but was playing Billy, an instrument as well. Yeah, and Billy and Dom also change um, uh, like spots uh, through throughout the scene in various uh, various times. Mm. Now, could you see you there playing? I was playing in a band, yeah. Yeah, I think. I was playing in a band. Isn't that just the best firework display in the world? <laughs> Very cool. Wow. And and you're there's a shot of you carrying the cake. Yeah. Dumb, and then suddenly you're on stage, yeah. or you were on stage just before. Yeah. Pete loves all that stuff. There's oh, Billy, Billy and Katie. Uh, and Billy. Billy and Katie. I just think these kids, if they ever wanted to grow up as actors, 
they're just look at that face. She's so in the moment. She's like. <laughs> His kids are absolute magic. So good. I adore these two. Now hang on, this is the entrance to end all entrances. Look at this. Oh my god. There we are. If that is not two movie stars. Cheeky. <laughs> we really look like hobbits here. Yeah. The whole reaction thing. <laughs> Very cool. Pete allowed me to do this. I, I, I went for it. I said, let me bite the apple at the end. And eat. You love the apples? Yeah, I just thought... Do you I, remember I we always did, wanted Mary to keep eating and eating and eating. Did one take where I ran past and caught my neck on that rope. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was like the camera was running. Oh, yeah. this is the sack oh. ba bag into this bit that was cut out. Oh, yeah. Well, that's between listen. Ian and I. His ears twitch when he when they're around. Very cool. Help him hide here. I flew over from uh, from London with Billy, and I met him. Um, I met him at the uh, foreign exchange, one of the foreign exchange counters, and there are numerous within uh, Heathrow. But uh, I have, we'd, we'd pass through the check-in, and, and I'd, I met him at the foreign exchange counter. I was like, I walked up to the counter and I said, "Could I get some New Zealand dollars?" And uh, Billy was just walking past, and he just turned to me and he said, you must be an elf. And I was like, Billy Boyd. And we just had this massive hug. Never met him before, had no idea what he was going to look like, and it was just amazing. So I flew over with Billy, and um, it was a great introduction. We, we sat on the plane and learnt the, learnt the, uh, the ring, the poem, the ring poem at the beginning of the book together, and it was like, it was just great. That noise is Billy, Billy shrieking screaming like a girl because like he thought that his pants were on fire. <laughs> is that well, really? Is well, that nobody, left on the soundtrack? Yeah. Nobody, nobody told us that it was actually going to blow up. You know, uh, yeah. I thought we were just going to do that and then we'd do the blowing up bit later. <laughs> but, so it did blow up. I shrieked, wet myself. Yeah, I kind of laughed. He laughed. And, uh, and they kept the take. So. And he has called me pissy legs since. <laughs> This is great. This next shot of us guys coming up after the fireworks. It took them about 40 minutes to change our look to this. Look at those faces. And we came out singing Chim Chimney from uh, Mary Potter's uh, Looking Like Chimney Sweeps. That was a laugh that great day, wasn't fun. it? We had really good fun that day. It was a riot that day. Oh. This was good. I still have pictures of you guys like that. This is all forced perspective as well. Yeah. Where the, this table's all a different shape, do you remember? Mm. It was on different levels and yeah, so that the, bigger in the front where Ian is and smaller yeah. in the back where yeah. you are. I was about two foot behind Ian. I was always nervous as to how they were going to um, have the the ring bearer disappear. You know, oh, how right, me as well. If they were going to do a kind of Star Warsy thing, you know, it's very <laughs> selective kind of. Thing. See for the reaction shots of the hobbits. Did, did you not read this? Was he in there? Dom? Um, did you not read it one oh, time? Oh, that's far? right. Yeah, they had, they had me doing, like, a jack of all trades. I read this speech uh, for the crowd. And then also when Ian finds the ring at the very start and Gollum says, my precious. Yeah, you were Andy's Gollum. circus wasn't there, so I was Gollum for a day, which is great because it was the only scene I ever did with just Ian Holm. So, mm, that's so cool. I think... Uh, that's why it was like a student film, uh, a big budget, you know, it student like film. It. Because depending on where you were, out on an abandoned location or something, you would. I mean, lots of times I'd help people Extra carry duties. batteries, you yeah. know, up to a set or to a location or something like that. And you know, it was, it was all for the, it was all for the, the good of the movie. Mm. It was the mentality. Yeah, exactly. Mm. I love that sound effect. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, they actually had Ian Holm in this scene and then they took him out digitally. It's really clever. There he is. I can just... Can you still make him out? There he is. There it... No, hey. he's gone. Are you sure? There he is. <laughs> Very good. I can... Can you guys not see him? I, think I can see him. There he is. See? Oh, yeah. yeah. He was there all the time for me, though. <laughs> we were not uh, doing this together. Uh, we, we, this was filmed on separate occasions, so Ian's looking up into space and so I'm looking down into it and, and the island wasn't quite accurate there. There are many magic rings. And none of them should be used lightly. None of them should be used lightly. It was just a bit of fun. The cinematography in this scene is awesome. Unbelievable. The effect that they do on Ian where he just starts to go all dark around Don't him. take me for a conjurer of cheap tricks. Mm. And... As often as I can spare them. 
That's, that's when he becomes a wizard. That's when you sort of yeah. go like, oh, oh, okay, so he's a wizard. And I love it here where you see Ian get Ian Holm get taken over by the ring and become quite nasty. And, and that little fun. punch that he does yeah. is unbelievable. You want it for yourself? One of my favorite moments in the movie. Very cute. You know, somebody who, who I think is just needs mentioning as well is, um, when I first saw it as well, what Howard Shaw did with the music, it's so mind-blowing. I just think the subtlety, the his his ability to sort of layer it in there, like it's a perfect complement to this film, and it's almost like it's not there. You know, it's like it just it just the subtlety in the way it kind of adds to the tension and of the drama of the moment. It's just I was so impressed at, at every level, at every stage of the of the journey and 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 of the film. You just the way that the music underscores it so subtly. I think that's the talent, you know, right there. Well, if I'm angry, it's your fault. Just as an actor, watching him work the different camera angles with his face, I mean, he's just such a genius. It's hard to talk during this. It's so captivating. Mm. I've seen it far too many times to mention. But... That's big acting, but it's worth it, isn't it? Because you, 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 you know some big things are at stake. Ah, oh, fantastic. Ugh. The sound of the wood creaking in yes. the background yeah. is awesome. It's as if Bag End is stretching. Yeah. It's so sweet, Gandalf. I, I think Ian McKellen does such a fantastic job in in these sequence in these scenes with with the hobbits, childlike little hobbits. Mm. But he just he's he's like the the granddaddy, you know, of the of the whole film. You know, he's like the. The kind of he is the wise old grey wizard that we turn to, but um, it just it just speaks for his uh, you know the way he portrayed the portrayed the role you know. The ring must go to. Fruit. I think we were all quite worried about the scale issue, but it just it it's works serious. so well. It yeah. does. It really does. Yeah, I was worried. I mean, some of the early footage that we saw where Definitely. they were using the scale doubles and stuff, it just was so obvious to me that it wasn't you know you me or you yeah. or you yeah. know. But it's amazing. Well, like this next shot of him walking away is Kieran, right? Yeah. Also, when he drops the ring onto the floor, they had a magnetic floor, so they. Did they? Yeah. So the I ring, didn't know that. so the ring wouldn't bounce as it as it hits the floor. It sticks by a magnet to the other side of the floor. Oh, that's fantastic! Isn't that great? How did you know that? I'm clever, man. There you go. Did you? The weight of of the one ring. Exactly. Oh, that's so cool. That's great. I didn't know that. Well, you need to just kind of learn. I suppose if I watch the DVD, I'll, I'll get that. Yeah, there you go. Now that exterior, the shot just before that was uh, was actually on the set because they did have the exterior of of the opening to Bag End. Yeah. Uh, on the stage. Oh yeah. It's one of the things that you that took a long time for me to get used to the idea of having trust and faith in was Peter's complete confidence that a shot inside the set here and just a quick reverse that's actually outside in Hamilton where you see what's going on in the sh I mean, it, it's so seamless. And, and they were done, shots were done. I mean, this shot was done maybe five months later than the shot, two yeah. shots previous. It's all of these little bits, which is something I think all of us had to get used to because everything was shot. Like right there, that's on the set in Wellington. Mm. And the shot just outside before that was in Hamilton about five, you know. And that was probably an insert 400 shot miles away. done on that day. Of mm -hmm. the ring, you know what I mean? Probably like the Richard Bluck unit. But it just goes to show you that when you, you know... Wow, I love that. That's the eye. That scared the bejesus out of me the first <laughs> time I saw it in the cinema. Really made me jump. The voice for Gandalf, uh, you know, I I, I... I thought of a man who smoked a bit too much, so there was a little rasp in the voice. And, um, he was of a certain age, of course, and the voice does get a bit tired. I, I, I thought it right that he should be have a, a received English pronunciation because probably like Tolkien and all the characters in the story are like Tolkien, uh, he was of that middle class that would speak with and that sort of voice, cultured voice, an Oxford voice. I wanted him to sound a little bit old-fashioned, a little bit careful with the way he spoke. And um, when I listened to Tolkien, um, reading bits from Lord of the Ring, uh, it was confirmed that Tolkien had a voice rather like that himself, and so I was happy that uh, Gandalf should too hit that very, very early on, and it just seemed right when matched with the, um, the makeup. 
wrong with all these I have a stamp. I have a wax stamp with a D on it. They're so cool. Do you really? Yeah, I do. It's the coolest thing in the world. I've got a wax stamp with um, with the uh, the Japanese letters for Frodo. That's right. I got mine in Japan as well. Well done. Well, I look forward to having a correspondent. I will never send you a letter. Well, ever. thank you very much. Ever. I'll send you one, Billy. Thank oh. you. Thank yeah. you, Elijah. That's very sweet. Just to let everybody know, Ian does not have a, a nose like that. No. <laughs> it's, a, it's a prosthetic piece. I wouldn't like people to think that he had a kind of beak. Put your eye on. These shots are, to me, with the, with the combination of the miniatures, I mean, that's uh, just the coolest. There's a lot of elements at play here. I know. It's, it's all these different digital elements, the scenic... I mean, it's just awesome. Because mm. that, yeah. that right there, I mean, as a, an actual building... That's a, a model. A miniature. That's a miniature. And the guys spent a year building it mm. and crafting it. All those it. tiny little candles as well. Mm. Mm. Those are digital. <laughs> that was what was... Aha. Uh -huh. No, but the thing... I know that. I know that. Here they come. Awesome shot. Doors open. Here come the boys. A shot like that reminds you of a western, doesn't it? And yet you're in a landscape you've never seen before. Oof, yeah. That's awesome. And the sound just makes it work so yeah. great. A little taste of Minas Tirith. Yeah. To be, uh, to be seen at a later date in full. It's funny, they, you know, it's technically a miniature because it's not the size of a real city, but it's huge when you walk into the building and see other I mean. To me, that's mm. like, that's the thing that, after seeing the movie five, six, the seven bigotures. times, I start, they're bigotures. The bigotures. Makes it because that, that like scene there, yeah. uh, <laughs> two seconds ago when uh, Ian was walking up the street, that must have been in the real Minas Tirith, which was like only set... built on the last three months or something. Isn't that shooting. incredible? Yeah. yeah. There's a great scene from the gag room in <clears> where he's uh, rifling through paper and he comes across script pages. And rips them apart. <laughs> yeah, every day. That's something people watching the DVD probably don't know. Every day they were constantly rewriting, polishing, adjusting, writing scenes for the sets that were almost finished being built that we were going to be shooting on 48 hours later or something like that. Yeah. Also, I think in an attempt to get as you know closer and closer to Tolkien, while well, sort of straddling that fine line between, yeah, the antiquated language that might not resonate with a contemporary audience, but being true to it at the same time. Mm. They did it. They did a phenomenal job. Uh, you're not so tough, doggy. Well, here's one question that someone had is, is do hobbits have dogs like that? This guy does. <laughs> not, not for long. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. He reminds me of you, Bill. I think he's a toque. You think he is? Yeah, he kind of looks... He does look so he does like, like you. Okay. That hobbit hole is just the, just the facade, right? Just yeah. the front little faceplate of a hobbit. Yeah. Oh, here oh, we here go. Is. Yes! Green dragon. Finally. This was something that we really, really fought to get in the film and unfortunately didn't make it. Really. Devastating that it wasn't in the film. Because, well, I mean... It's such a hobbit moment. We're drunk. Not in... <laughs> Not in real life. You guys owned that song. Yeah. It was so good. It was a long, nerve-wracking day singing in front of all those people. Yeah. It was. We d Yeah, we did fight for that. I mean, mainly because it, it establishes the relationship between us, which is awesome, and you also get a sense of the, the kind of sweeter, happier moments before the journey. Ensues. Yeah. You seldom see hobbits behaving, you know, as they get, really should do. And nice moments with a... Uh, with Sam there as well. Yeah. He knows an idiot when she sees one. I love that. I nice, love that nice. That oh, that was a fantastic shot of BK just there. Uh, yeah. Doing the drunken Sam walk. <laughs> For people who don't know, BK is uh, is three feet four inches tall, probably mm. in reality. Something like that. And he's from India. He's a gorgeous man. Incredible chess player. Great. I chess love player. red wine. <laughs> and had a uh, had a very interesting sort of head jiggle. I don't it's know, very sort of, characteristic of Indian. Yeah, people. it was a kind of, sort of confidence. Mm. You know, to say yes, to say yes, they kind of shake their head. Yeah, like, yes. As if it were no. I can't believe Elijah was eighteen when he started filming this. I cannot believe that the guy was eighteen and he he assumed the responsibility of pretty much leading this band of merry 
this fellowship of merry races and individuals. He's such a courageous young man, you know, at that age, you know, and, and, and I mean, he's sort of worldly wise anyway, you know, he's sort of inert wisdom that, you know, somebody who's, who's been well brought up and also experienced life on many different levels through work, I would imagine as well, but he, um, he did an incredible job. I, I'm thinking now of something that will be seen in the third movie, in the end of the end of the third movie, you know, right at the end. And uh, I remember seeing a shot in that the fire, the Mount Doom, you know. Where I remember seeing some rushes from that, which were coming out in the third movie, obviously. And um, and I just thought, my God, the guy, he just transformed, you know. He went on this journey as a hobbit and. Uh, you know, as a young hobbit leaving the Shrier and becoming this kind of warrior, hobbit and human, you know, as a hobbit and a human, Elijah grew immensely over this whole production and I, I'm constantly amazed at his, um, his sensitivity and his look and his, you know, his, his, his sort of handle on the character and, and the dialogue. And I know as an actor to, try, to, do, to do an accent is not easy. It's just a, not an easy thing to do. It can really block you and yet he just embraced it and went with it and uh, very, very talented young guy. I've had several people ask me in all sincerity if your eyes were digitally enhanced. I know, I've yeah. been asked the same question by far too many people. <laughs> and, and I keep saying no, no. It's, well, the it's, thing that, that always gets me is they're like, do you wear contacts? I said, yes, I do. Ah, ah. Uh, you got busted. No, not clear contact. Like clear, um, bad vision. No, yeah. but not just for the color. People want to know if your eyes are made bigger on screen. Yeah. Yeah. They did have to mess around with your eyes a little bit, though, because you are quite cross-eyed in real life, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> it's just nice, because that's not very movie star Elijah. You it's need not. to look straight, you know? I know. I've got my own digital enhancer that travels with me everywhere yeah. I go. <laughs> I remember the, the first day my daughter met you. It was like... Uh, I fell in love. Oh, she that? fell in love. She looked at your eyes, and, and it was like you two mind-melded. It was amazing. Oh, she's wonderful. Mind-melded. That's great, John. Mind-melded. I'm going to write that down. I was lucky not to... Uh, to be basically using my own voice and my own accent. Um, you forget, don't you, that Elijah Wood is not. Uh, he, he's always speaking with a foreign accent, effortlessly, but... Uh, Nevertheless, you had to pronounce Mordor. You had to get those resident R's. That was my first blue screen shot. Oh, yeah? Yeah. That's great. Walking on a blue board. God, do you remember when they used this shot in every trailer? Yeah, I got kind of sick of it myself. <laughs> <laughs> I was in a movie theater, and it was later in the sort of half-life of that trailer. Uh -huh. And everybody was saying the line along with you out loud. No. Yes, they were. Oh, great. <laughs> oh my God. It was awesome. This just an awesome shot. These these are my favorite shots in the movie. These, like, the anvils and the iron. Oh, poor oh, God. Look at them go. Some of the most incredible CG. It's great. Something very adorable about Gollum, even though he kind of is, you know, quite a snidey little character. I hate to see him get tortured. It's horrible. Yeah. Man, the Black Riders, are they not like, just do they not embody evil and fear? I mean, they're fantastic. Like, I was, I was shaken up because the Black Riders were just so scary and stuff. And I always ask kids, actually, when I meet them and they talk to me about rings, I'm like, so did you find the Black Riders scary? And a lot of them try and put on a brave face, but I reckon, uh, I reckon the Black Riders really, they just embody fear, you know. And what's great is that they're ghosts, they're shadows of, of who they were. You know, it's like if you don't confront your fear, you become it. But it cannot stay in the Shire. And that's one of the moments when Gandalf realises, despite his age, despite his experience, despite his knowledge, he doesn't have the same resource for success in this venture as uh, that little angelic-looking hobbit. Yes. It's great that you try all those things to kind of not take it though. It's really hobbity. What's you that? Know, not to be a hero, not to say, what should I do straight away? Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. you do all the other options first, you know, you, you take, take it, it yeah. or somebody else take it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll bury it. It can't stay here. <laughs> Ian was, you know, really, I mean, I, I remember when I first, when he first arrived in New Zealand and he was around, I kind of couldn't take my eyes off him for a couple of months, <laughs> in a way. It was like, even when his back was turned, he just sort of draws you in. It's like he's he's constantly switched on or something, you know, it's just his his presence is, is very kind of 
mesmerizing and interesting. I mean, he's, you know, uh, he, this is a, an opportunity to work with the likes of Mr. McKellen and Mr. Holm and Mr. Lee. You know, I mean, they're, they're in the history books in terms of life achievement in acting and, and, and what they've done for characters and how they've brought them to life. So I couldn't have been more privileged and proud to be working with them. Where do you imagine he hits you, Sean? Right on the top of your head? Shoulder. Shoulder, right. It was amazing when I saw when I saw this and I just saw Sean, he was so funny. He was just so sensitive, sweet and funny. I was so pleasantly surprised at, at the kind of, the way that Sam had, he'd portrayed Sam, you know? I mean, I, you know, when I was working with the Hobbits, I was normally working with their doubles. I mean, I hung out with the Hobbits all the time off set and stuff. But, um, you know, I really didn't see a lot of what was going on and I was just, he was so, so charming and um, and brave as that as that as that character, you know. I love that that sequence where he's thrown over the table. The exposition of the story so far is uh, told very neatly uh, in in the book, and it's clear that there are a number of years pass uh, between what in the film seem to be events that are following very closely uh, on each other, but. It could have been rather laughable that so much information is given so quickly. I think that was easily avoided because uh, I, as Gandalf, and, and uh, Elijah, uh, as Frodo, and, and uh, Ian Holmes, Bilbo, knew that what we were talking about was very, very important, not just for our characters, but for all the characters uh, who inhabit uh, Middle-earth. So what, what, once you say uh, it's the future of the world which is at stake, what seems on the face of the script to be a simple exposition turns out to be uh, the matter, a matter of life and death. Oh, I remember this day. This was fun. Yeah, that looks really cool. That was when we didn't have anything to shoot uh, up on the mountain. On it's um, the north, Mount northern Owen. Mount Owen, yeah. No, no, right, remember northernmost we, part we of waiting? the... Uh, All those days of playing Cup. Oh, Cup. Oh, yeah. Well, Cup was fun. Fantastic game. Cup, uh, by the way, is when you take a paper cup Dixie and cup. a Dixie cup uh, if you're American. Mm. And <laughs> or a paper cup if you speak English. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you keep it up um, just by passing it to each other, which sounds quite boring, but if you're waiting for a, a helicopter for four days, yeah. it becomes the main way to pass the day. Hours. I would just like to say here that it's an original Dominic Monaghan game available online at my website. Um, uh, you can use different cups, but if you want, you can log on to my website and get an official cup cup. Thank you. Dominic Monaghan's CrazyGames.com. Another game called Nudge, which uh, Billy is a huge fan of. So if anyone wants me to, you know, get involved with game making, I'm uh, available. Speaking of game making, what, what was the name of the fake game that y'all tried to get me into? Oh, uh, <laughs> t t tig? Tag? Tig. 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 That was good. Oh, my God. And, and Tig, uh, it was when we were filming Weathertop. And myself and Dom just started tigging each other, you know, touching each other and going, tig, tig, just like, <laughs> for no reason. And then Sean came over. Slightly different from tag. And he came over and started doing it as well, tig. And then we'd say, tig, 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 tag, like, for Tom, no reason. Tom, tig. And, uh, and then Elijah came over and said, what are you guys doing? I said, oh, we're playing a game uh, called Tig. And he says, how do you play? And then we spent, like, the next two hours mm. making up rules. And, and trying to teach me, and, of course, I was getting everything wrong. Yeah. He couldn't, he couldn't follow the game, and the three of us were ever frustrated that he wasn't following these new rules that we would continue to make up. So we would play, the three of us were all constantly <laughs> getting it right. Every time Elijah tried a new way of tigging someone, we'd say, no, Elijah, you can't tig on a tog, you can't <laughs> tag on a tig, you have, to, you have to do an elephant impression if you're going to tig Billy. And if, <laughs> if Billy's going to tig you back, you yeah. have to get on your knees and take your trousers down. <laughs> How many times, Elijah, you can't double tig a tag? Yeah. You know, these kind of... <laughs> and, and for like three weeks, he was saying uh, how much he enjoyed playing tig and that he... And, uh, and he wanted game. to get the rule book, didn't he? But do you get... remember that we forgot to say it was a wind-up? Yeah. And it was like a year later, he says, why do we never play tig? <laughs> <laughs> and then they finally let it, the, 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 the tag out of the bag. My whole world came shattering down on me when they told me that that was a lie. Because yeah. for a whole year, I believed oh. that that was a real game, and then they told me and that. Sorry, Elijah. Sorry, Elijah. <laughs> what else? What else was was not true? That's what I was asking. No, it undermines the integrity of the entire relationship. That's I, I agree. That's, that's what I think. It was part of the whole bonding experience, though. Yeah. Although me and Dom are actually just lies. Yeah. <laughs> big bag of lies. Not that big a bag. You hear his voice, saying. And Gandalf the Grey rides to Isengard bearing ill news. That was the original line. 
Gandalf the Grey rides to Isengard, seeking my counsel. They changed it, which I think was an improvement. It's Gandalf the Grey rides to Isengard, seeking my counsel. For that is why you are here, is it not, my old friend? Or why you have come, is it not, my old friend? And just for that fleeting moment, there is the appearance of a reasonable man. Although he isn't a man, he appears to be. And in human shape. That is the only moment, and then when Gandalf starts to tell in the gardens at Isengard that the ring has resurfaced, then you can almost see the brain beginning to work. Now is his chance. The ring of power has been found. Within his fortress, the Lord of Mordor. I think Christopher Lee was very keen to, to play Gandalf at one point, wasn't he? But, um, just to be involved in the movie in any way. He's a massive fan of the book. Yeah. He knew the sort of sacred importance of the of the text to, to the people who loved the loved them for so long, loved mm -hmm. the books for so long. Christopher's performance is just magical. You know that Christopher uh, uh, I think wrote to Tolkien so many times. It was one of his great dreams to play Gandalf. And I think he I, I think he may have actually had Tolkien's blessing to do that. He is um, such a remarkable actor, and, and there was once a time when, you know, he was the most recognizable actor in the world. Intellectually, of course, he is probably one of the brightest men on that production. He was a partisan, he fought with the partisans, you know, in World War II. He's an extraordinary brave man. He's, I mean, essentially he was SAS at that time. He has a range of reading and experience and a depth of thinking that very few actors that I know have ever had. Yeah, I definitely got nervous when he came around because I wanted to make sure that any pronunciations were as correct as they could be. And really? Yeah, absolutely. He had trouble getting around in his clothes, I remember. Mm -hmm. Well, they're long. They're long and flowy. I remember one, at one point he said, these, these clothes really are a menace. Yeah, it's great. It's such a fantastic way of talking. Can't get up these goddamn stairs, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> It's very difficult for people to understand, unless they're told, that Saruman is not a human being, nor is Gandalf. They are immortal. What is never really explained is, when did Saruman begin to turn? We are told he was great, noble, powerful, kindly, decent, wise, all the positive characteristics that the the ideal human being should possess. We are told that. Gandalf even says it. He was great once. But what we aren't told is when he turned. At some point, he believes that he can be more powerful than Sauron. I was pleased we were nominated by MTV as the best fight of the year. This is a mixture of, of the actors uh, and the very athletic uh, doubles who fall on their backs and so on. Uh, but if you ever get close to the character, it's me, and I think that's me sliding around on the floor. And certainly when um, Saruman twists me around uh, on the floor, that, that, that was me in, in a cradle with my legs um, held up by an invisible um, wire. There I go, that really is me, very painful indeed. And just off the set was a chiropractor, um, Steve Thompson, ready to help me with physiotherapy. That is not me going up into space. I don't know who it was. It took a long time. And we did a fair amount of it ourselves, falling onto the floor backwards and so on. I mean, not from a huge height. But we, we well, we got knocked about a bit. And... Uh, I had no idea what it was going to look like. I had no idea until I saw the film. It works very well, very well indeed. This is when I knew Dom didn't like me because he hit me so hard when he came out of the cornfield. <laughs> was, I was it my in birthday a, this day? I was close to, I think. I was in a really bad mood this day because uh, being in a field surrounded by plants and, and 
things. I just got really bad hay fever and I was sneezing and my skin was going crazy, so I was in a yeah. very bad mood. Simple way of, 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 of keep reminding the audience that the hobbits are smaller than human beings, but just having them walking around uh, under those heavy, the, the, those large plants. The shot here. Yeah. Stupid Sam. <laughs> I wasn't the one who stopped in the middle of the road. Well, we could have stayed up if you hadn't banged into us. This is the first, first day of filming. First shot we ever filmed in the movie, right? First day of filming. <laughs> yeah, Elijah let out a little Tommy squeaker. <laughs> that's a true story. Yeah. That is a very Elijah true story. had gas and it was, emitted no, a it was great... pressure gas. It was pressure gas? Yeah. I mean, was, it wouldn't have come out was, if Dom wouldn't have landed on you? It was, yeah, exactly. But you got, I didn't even hear it. I was too busy sort of... Concentrating you know. on the scene. Uh, yes. Yeah. I actually blew a part in my hair. <laughs> <laughs> the translation there, it blew a part in his hair. Parting, parting. <laughs> part isn't funny. Uh, <laughs> 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 There's a nice reference to a chapter in the movie called A Shortcut to Mushrooms here where I say it was just a shortcut and Sam says a shortcut to what and then Billy says mushrooms. Which is Peter, uh, that's when I knew that Peter was really committed to making sure that the audience, that he put things in there that fans of the book would be able to sort of latch on to as a fun connection. Because yeah. when would, you, when would the, the, a chapter title be said and to work it into a, in the lines of the movie? Oh, this was the first shot we did, wasn't it? No, I thought Falling Down was the first No, thing. Falling Down was the first was thing the we first did. Thing we... Yeah. No, I thought it was coming up over the... No, we did that later in the day. Right, this yeah. was the first, still the first day of filming. Did you notice the boo-boo with the, uh, the horse? Yeah. How it kind of magically comes out of the tree. Yeah. You mean he doesn't pass from the other side? No. He, he comes from out, from out from the center. I don't know what's happening at the moment here, but I look really handsome. <laughs> 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 those those insert shots of the uh, of the worms coming out were done months and months and months later, where they had the stage with the uh, Lothlorien flats. That's right. And they out, did it on the out, side. And out on the other side, they were sort of. We were like, "What are you doing with these?" Sort of. It was like uh, some sort of National Geographic. They had a wetter yeah. there as well. I don't know why they've not included more of the spider because the spider goes over my shoulder. I then put him in my hand and then I put him on a log and I don't know why they didn't. Include that. It was uncomfortable under there, wasn't it? We were yeah. all sort of elbowing each other for space. It was quite cold as well, and I remember because it was the first day. Uh, did we? We didn't have feet on that day, I don't think, did we? Did we? Yeah, we did. No, yeah, we, we did. did. no, we didn't, because I remember you took your boots off, Sean, to get the kind of oh, feeling that's of right. the. And then, we, and then I think we all thought, oh, we're hobbits, we better take our boots off. But it was really cold. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so. I, th I think for, your feet well, for were the colder shot, than anybody's but, but through the duration of the shoot. For the shot of us jumping over, we had feet. Yeah, so it must have been. The next day the when next we... Day, Do you remember this? The ground was up. so slippery that we were falling over. Sean, you fell on your, on your face a couple of times. It was times, raining yeah. here, yeah? It was That's raining right. and we had our the slippery Our shoes feet. were flying off and our feet were And remember, off. once we got to the end of the run, that we couldn't actually get back up the hill to get yeah. to the start again. People had to carry us oh, up and right. stuff. That's right. No traction whatsoever. I love that little bit there. The first real interaction between Fro Frodo and Merry. And the yeah, whole yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I always like that. Day for night. Mm. Shot that in the day. Here we go. Best line in the movie right now. Right? right. Buckleberry Ferry. Follow me. Oh, that was magical. just. I mean, that's breathtaking. It was it really it's Harrison Ford, basically. Yeah. This was kind of scary. Hey guys. They had that horse up on the little dance floor yeah, that they built in the forest, and the coolest was the Buckleberry Ferry, though. Yeah. I acquired a very, very painful splinter when we did the Buckleberry Ferry thing. Did you? Yeah, I was nearly hospitalised. Do you not remember that? Just here. He was in tears, he was sweating, he almost fainted. Yeah. And it was about the size of... Of a house. <laughs> it, was like, it was like half the size of a, a matchstick. Yeah, but a, well, I think it was made of platinum or something. Good jump. Oh, good jump, you. good jump. So that was the second take because the first take he actually jumped right over the um, barge and landed fell in the water. In the but water, I did a, a fantastic swan dive. Yeah, it was great. Eight point five. Remember this? It was a belly flop. This ferry kept sinking as well, and nobody could figure out how to put it together. And then Barry Osborne, our producer, who was like a military guy, an army guy in the Korean War or something, he comes out with his army manual and he's like, "Okay, let's yeah. figure it out." And Barry single-handedly repaired Buckleberry Ferry. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and the horse fell in the water with the guy. Yeah. And the, yeah. No. Yeah. He, the really? horse was was drowning. It was like kicking and everything else. He lifted, helped him out. That's a new addition to the story. Yeah. yeah. 
This reminds me of, of, of uh, Dickens or David Lean's version of Dickens and I, I you know, the mud, the old buildings, the, the shadows. Very wet and cold this day. <laughs> I remember this day. This is a fantastic shot. Tell him the, the story behind that, mate. My um, idea. <laughs> well, tell him, it's fantastic. I just thought of something else where um, <laughs> Billy and I turned up a couple of hours earlier and it, was, it wasn't dark yet. We were, we were waiting for the light to dim. And there was all golf balls in the ground. <laughs> <laughs> in the ground that were there to map out oh, certain no. people's movements and all this kind of stuff. And I turned around to Bill and I said, look, there's some golf balls over there, Bill. I'm going to have one. I just went over, picked up a golf ball and walked off and Billy was saying, no, put it back. <laughs> It's there for a reason, Dom. <laughs> what people don't understand is Mary and Pippin are completely um, changed round. It's like a mirror image in real life. <laughs> Dom, Dom and me, are, I'm like Mary and he's Pippin. <laughs> hey, did we miss Peter's cameo? Uh, yeah, we just did. Yeah, yeah. This is in the studio in Wellington. So With from... the big rigs, which they didn't ultimately use very much. Yeah, there's well, a one to get told, Paul, who, uh, a guy called Paul, was, um, who doubled for virtually everyone. They had a costume, and he was like seven foot four or something. Good evening, little masters. What can I do for you? If you're Good evening, little masters, he says. Now, this guy walking by us is actually a five foot tall female gymnast on stilts dressed as a man. Called Becky. Yeah. Rebecca Fitzgerald. She was also the front of the horse. In some scenes, when we used a pantomime horse, when remember that? That's right. Or build the pony. Build the pony. Yeah. Pony. 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 <laughs> this guy was an interesting guy. This was all shot in well. Pointy hat. I haven't seen him in years. Oh shit. <laughs> Sorry. How many times have you seen this? This what? always looks weird to me, this bit. Why do we all lean in at the same time? Just a bit strange. I'm, I'm completely blocking you with my shadow we're as well. little hobbits out of our element and we're, we're huddling for a conference. Mm. Yeah. What is it about cheese and bread that hobbits love? So I don't know, it's good though. I it like is, that cheese and good. bread. Great faces looks... in this bar. What's that? Once again, I don't know what's happening here, but Billy and I look really handsome. Some strange Some cinematography strange. going on there. It may have this... been the digital grading. Did they just add a shot of a cat in there? Yeah. No, that's that was in the movie. in the movie? Yeah. I wonder how many innocents are buying their plane tickets to New Zealand in the hope of visiting the Prancing Pony or these other sites uh, long since destroyed or collected away for some museum feature maybe eventually, but... Uh, there's very little evidence of Middle Earth in, in New Zealand now, or the Middle Earth of the movie. Strider. Strider. Great introduction of Vigo here. I think this is possibly one of the coolest entrances to a movie ever. He wasn't here when you did this, right? This is no, all this is no, blue screen. Blue screen pass. And this was quite early in the shoot, wasn't it? Yeah. Vigo, he's like a hero of mine now. Such a generous actor, such a fantastic guy to work with. You know, he's so brilliant. Um, his attention to detail, his his focus and his um, work ethic, you know, the way he kind of puts everything he's got into his role. And he was great, because this is my first experience on a film, and he just um, was a fantastic guide, you know? Those shots of um, Frodo's hands revealing that he bites his nails are very touching. Uh, brave of, of Elijah to reveal that he bites his nails right down to the quick, uh, except I, I said to him one day, you, do, do not mind people knowing that you bite your nails. No, 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 he just smiled, no. And those ring rays screeching, it's just mm. like, just behind wow. the idea. Actually, when Peter, who would act out all of the different parts and all of the different yeah. monsters and everything else to try and get us to have a sense of what it was we were supposed to be afraid of, would do that screeching sound. And I would always sort of wonder, you know, what the actual sound would sound like when it was finally done, because he had such a specific... Yeah, and it sounded really exactly rah! like it, actually. Yep. Just, you know, more. I, I wonder if the uh, audience was asked uh, who's the oldest of the... Of the uh, the four hobbits, whether they would guess it was uh, Billy Boyd, that very, very youthful looking 
man in his early 30s. Convincingly playing against Elijah, who celebrated his 18th birthday uh, during the shooting. One of the very few scenes that we actually did rehearse. There are only a few that we actually went through. And this is in Stone Street Studios, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Studio B? It's in Studio yeah. B? That's right, yeah? Yeah. I was so terrifying in this scene that Vigo was really genuinely nervous. He I don't was, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Are, you, are you sure that's true? Yeah. <laughs> and right outside this room, because uh, that's the, 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 the smaller sized room, was the bigger size little that's portion. That's right, yeah. For the hobbits. For the hobbits to be on. These guys had a terrible time trying to get these horses through this mud. I remember. The mud was really thick. Really bad, yeah. This is a great shot. Mm. I love the way evil just follows them around, you know? Everything's cold around them, everything's dark. Mm. Very cool. Is That's it, an attractive it, shot of you, Don. Well, yeah, well, I had my mouth up, and there's a separate uh, take of me sucking my thumb, which, which Pete, is coming up. Pete just wouldn't put in. But did, I wonder if he took it out of this version. I think he did, you know. Why? I, mean, I uh, thought that was such a great little addition. Maybe it was a bit too over the top. I don't know if Mary would really suck his thumb. I never understood why they didn't just no, go across took it the out street again. to get us. They don't know we're on the other side of the street. You see them stabbing the pillows, and you really think, <gasps> oh, my God, they've got them. They're probably saying to each other, oh, the hobbits are just pillows. They're just pillows. <laughs> <laughs> Who'd have thought it? They become feathers <laughs> when you stab them. How can he carry a ring if he's just made of feathers? I remember having a slight laughing fit when we did this scene because I was so close to you. <laughs> Just leaning further and further into you. Do you notice at the beginning of that shot you can actually see me move back into frame? Because remember I had to start the, out? Because the camera, the cam that's right. To make room for the camera? To pass so close in front of you. Works though, it works. It does work. It does work. Your eye, it's too quick unless you stop and look at it. Your eye doesn't catch it. I've seen it too many times. I pick it up every time now. And you were there when you did it. This is true. <laughs> Well, so are you. This is quite late on, right? The horse stepped on my prosthetic foot and ripped off my toes this day. <laughs> I stepped on glass that day and didn't know until the end because my foot was so numb. It's great, this kind of division with the, with the hobbits uh, and, and Aragorn at the moment, with Strider mm. at the moment. Still don't know whether they should trust him, but they have no choice. Well, I remember in, this, in the marshes scene that's coming up, I was to be leading... Bill the pony through the marshes, but they oh. couldn't put the horse in the marshes because I mean, it was hard enough for us to get out of it. It was, and they didn't want the horse to get stuck. Well, look at there it is. But but in one horse. of the but it was a fake horse, and in one of the close-ups, I have the rope leading it, and just behind me, just out of frame, is uh, another guy holding the rope up. So I was sort of leading one of the grips. <laughs> now this we could talk about forever. The oh, snow. The this snow. Is, the is this the day we actually got snowed out? Yeah, we yeah. showed up in the morning, no snow on the ground, not even a cloud. I mean, the clouds were just starting to form. And by three hours into it, it was the biggest snowstorm I've ever seen. This yeah, me too. What about second breakfast? I believe, actually, this was the day after. The day after. This, the, what's in here is the day after, the but day we started after. filming it without the snow. That's right. And we actually filmed in the snow with the biggest snowflakes I've ever seen. Yeah. It was like it would cover your whole, one flake would lay over your whole hand. I actually thought there were scale uh, snowflakes. I thought it was because of the hobbits. <laughs> oh, Ooh, that, that must have that hurt. hurt. Well, that was about the 15th. <laughs> it was starting to hurt then, yeah. And Vigo was actually throwing the apples. Hard. And, and he seemed to be really, really enjoying it, I thought. Oh, Midgewater Marshes. Oh, we got stuck in here. I'm glad they put the marshes back in. It's not right, because it was just hell. Do you remember? Mm-hmm. Was that a mm-hmm in unison? That was horrible, wasn't it? Oh, and you, Billy. And your prosthetic feet would start to get ripped, you know, ripped off. And, and um, sort of... look at this, this is outrageous. Sean Aston actually pushed me uh, when I fell into the water there. I he was said trying he was trying to, to help. help you. I don't think so. <laughs> pushed you right down. He pushed me. I think that the thing that I want to get across to people most about Vigo that I think is important for people to know, um, because it's, it's something that astonished me to no end was um, he was cast on this movie um, so fast. Like, they, they, you know, there was a whole controversy with this, with another actor cast as Aragorn. And it didn't work out, and he was let go within the first couple of days of filming. 
within that first week of filming, our schedule called for Aragorn. And we didn't have an Aragorn. It was a decision that was made to call Vigo and get Vigo. And it was one of those things where it wasn't like, well, let's try him out. Let's, the he will be perfect kind of thing. It was it, amazing how it worked out. He got the call, talked to them on the phone for hours, and agreed to do it. Uh, apparently, from what he says, greatly due to his son pushing him to do it because his son was a big fan of Lord of the Rings. I like what Christopher Lee's doing with his fingers. Mm. They look inhuman. Mm. On that particular day, um, Christopher had hurt his hand about three or four days previous. Got it closed He'd in a it stuck in a in a door, door, yeah. And he had to go to the hospital and have you know skin grafts and all the like. God. And uh, that's why he had to cover his hand for that particular shot. Mm. Looks good. Wonderful shot of the tree falling over there, and a very telling um, one for anyone who knows New Zealand, where the battle rages as to as to whether the virgin forests, which have been encroached on, of course, ever since human beings uh, moved into New Zealand only 800 years ago and, and began to um, farm there and have their sheep roaming, uh, it, it can still be headlines uh, in the local newspapers as to whether a, a tree or forest should should be um, should be pulled down. And uh, Peter Jackson is playing with something that uh, he and his countrymen care a great deal about. This uh, I love the whole theme of the, the way the industrialists are tearing apart the uh, the mm. earth oh, and yeah. for their own kind of you know mm. just a totally heartless and, and uncaring way and. Mm. cautionary tale of industrialism for its own end. I, I just love, and it comes through strong in the, really does, the tree yeah. getting ripped down. Yeah. It's cold up there. This was all blue screen? This was the great watch. Not all blue screen. No, that, well, that shot of... Uh, just the, little, the bit on the top that looks so rounded. Yeah. But there's a mountain. All this stuff. Yeah, that. I wonder which shots are mats as well, because there's a lot of matte paintings in the film, and I, no one's really pointed that out to me. These are for you. Keep them close. I'm going to have a look. I think that's my favorite line in the movie. Uh, as he throws me the sword, I go, Stay here. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a line? Well, it's, it's a gesture towards a line. <laughs> it's an utterance. I don't think I can read I remember it. I had to redo this in looping because it was so American. Really? What are you doing? I, I actually literally said, what are you doing? <laughs> uh, what are you I had doing? one like that back in the uh, in the forest when we were running, and and Roisin Cartier, or the uh, the number two dialect coach, came up to me, and my line was "Get down," and Sam is supposed to say, you know, Frodo, get down, and she came up to me and said, uh, Sean, that that was lovely. That that one went a little bit. Get down. Yeah. <laughs> I think you get down. Yeah. A little Damn, bit. Get down. That the shot previous where the hobbits pull out all the swords and oh. they turn around is actually uh, the rehearsals were responsible for one of the funniest things that I've ever seen Dom do. Uh, and I if, swear if, you can't, to God, I, mean, I mean, if they're not going to see... There's we, no, well, it's all right to make reference. We uh, we replayed that thing how many times? Like oh, 30 like, times? Yeah. yeah, and they were really mad with us because we were crying. We were making it, we were taking too long. And it was just Dom forgetting to do his exit, and then when he does remember, he does this double take, which is so funny. It's a mo it's a moment of realization. Oh yeah. my God! It's my turn. It's my I'm turn. supposed to be going. <laughs> That's fantastic. Oh, great shot. The use of slow motion in this movie is beautiful. Now you have to remember, between these shots, we were teaching Elijah how to play Tig. Yeah, <laughs> That's right. Keep that up at the back of your mind. The lie. This is nice. very early on in the shooting. That hurt, by the way, that landing on that rock. A lot of practice for sword fighting for me uh, for this sequence, uh, and I, I don't think there's any sword fighting. You drop, you drop the sword the first time you get a chance to use it. I swear, there were weeks and weeks of practice. That's the big man, he's clocked you. With Bob Anderson, the world-class sword master. This is right. Taught Errol Flynn and... Now Darth that's Vader. pathetic, Darth Elijah. Vader. Why couldn't you just get up and go, man? Well, there's this bit where he's got to put the ring on. Oh, great sound. Mm. I remember all the descriptions of what the Wraith world would be like when you had the ring on it. I couldn't wait to see the movie to mm. see how they do it, and it's just awesome. Well, yeah. they were still really trying to f figure out what it was themselves. And the eye as well. The eye was one of the last things to be designed. 
and you knew Peter had a clear vision of what he wanted and sort of faith that ultimately would get there, but it was it was tedious. I mean, over months and months and months, you're like, wow, what is it really going to look like? Yeah. How are they going to do it? Oh. Nice reaction. Thanks. Now, this is the oh. first time that we ever interacted with Vigo. In the filming? Yeah. Yeah. I That's think it was the first time I'd ever met Vigo. Really? I met him on set in Weathertop. You know, that was Vigo's first day on set, that sequence up there. That was his first day on set, and it was just like, he got off a plane, and like, I think within two days, he was like, to get in and start doing, um, doing this fight sequence stuff with those, defending the hobbits up there, just great. He taught me so much just in being around him and seeing him work at how to, the, you know, it's like, it's, it's your job as an actor to, to know exactly you know, we would shoot a scene from the movie, and, and, and at the end of that scene, say, Vigo would end up with his hand on his sword, like, looking out to the distance. At the end of that shot, that would be his last stance. A week later, we might have shot the following sequence. At the beginning of that sequence, Vigo would be standing there with his hand on his sword. You know, he'd be like, so hang on a minute, where, was we, where were we last? OK, we were there. OK, this is what I was doing. You know, I mean, so what that allows Pete to be able to do is to use all of that moment... Where, you know, because like for some actors, maybe they'd come out, the next scene they'd shoot it, they'd just have the hand there, you know what I mean? With their sword out. But they'd, he'd allow Pete to be able to use every moment. It was just oh, brilliant. What you see on the screen, the whole of Baradur, the whole of Orthanc, these incredible shots where the camera's up in the stratosphere, coming down towards Orthanc, and you see all round, lit up by the fires of the cauldrons and the forges, all these figures working away, working away, all for me. This was all done by Weta. Yeah, the miniature sets are just, I mean, they're just a credit, aren't they? Look at this. When you, and then, and then you know, it's not only what they did with the miniatures, but it's the way that they filmed it as well. The way they, just, literally, it's as if they just dropped a camera into sometimes, you know, when it just drops down and it, they really used it amazingly. I didn't actually these miniatures. Remember we visited? Yeah. In pickups, all that time, we, I had never gone anywhere. I knew what the they were doing, and I had talked stage. about going to look at it, but it was like we were so busy. So when we finally went back, we were able to see what they had, were accomplishing. And it's just, uh, I mean, it, it's the, everybody always talks about how great the computer effects are, and they are, mm -hmm. but the miniatures are just the, the sort of, the unsung, brilliant, you know, component to this movie that I just think makes it work. I agree. And Richard Taylor who, you know, runs Weta, the special effects company, the, the, um, the sheer volume of special effects that they turned out. I mean, I think they said something like Weta was the single, the company was the single largest orderer or purchaser of foam latex in the in world, the world yep. uh, to, for creating all of these masks and different props and everything else. This is great. And I didn't, I didn't get it when I was reading it that when they said, it, it, it goes by quickly, he's crossing orcs and goblins. And Moria, goblins. Goblins. Yeah. It's, it's, go, it's Goblin orcs man, and yeah. go, uh, goblins and orcs, yeah. And I was like, what does that mean, crossing orcs? He's literally cross-breeding. Yeah, yeah. It's like the first thing he does is he's born and he kills. You know? Isn't that incredible? And Saruman just says, no, let him kill him. That's the first thing he does. He comes out of that sleep and kills. Look at the look on Christopher Lee's face. He just adores this character. It's brilliant. It's like his child. Uh, this is, um... They put it back in with the cave trolls. The Bilbo's, Bilbo's trolls. Bilbo's trolls. A great homage. Look, Frodo. It's Mr. Bilbo's Oh, uh, fantastic. It's that a great homage to The Hobbit. I think when we were filming that, I had just read The Hobbit for the first time yeah. and, and knew what it was that we were seeing. That fantastic sequence where... Yeah, where Gandalf tricks the, the trolls into, you know, s arguing with each other instead until of... Sunrise. Uh, until sunrise. Until sunrise, well, instead of stone. eating the dwarves stone. and Bilbo, and they turn to stone, yeah. Yeah. And there they are, so, like, we're passing through. I love that. Atalas? Kingsfoil. Kingsfoil, ah, oh, it's a weed. It may help to slow. I bet it is a weed. Mm-hmm. It's no Buckleberry Fairy shot, but that's a pretty cool shot. I mean, come on. Mm, it's pretty good. Oh, Ranger, I love what Liv's done to her voice in this. Mm. She sounds a lot older. Doesn't she? It's very elven. 
It's a pretty phenomenal entrance to a movie as well, is it not? It's amazing. When she got off the plane, she was glowing like that. And I sort of thought, wow. I mean, that's a commitment. <laughs> this is the point in the film where all the men kind of go, oh, wait, hang on, <laughs> hang on, sit up straight. Hey? Eh? Concentrate. This was interesting because this was one of those moments where they were shooting in slow motion, which meant that while I was speaking my Elvish, I had to speak it faster, which was really confusing. <laughs> Um, so that it would match up time-wise. We shot this sequence twice. It was one of my first scenes that we did. And then later on in pickups, one of the last that we did. And we added some new w lines in, like, we must get him to my father. And it's really just to establish the connection and the, the, the you know, it's mysterious because you don't understand their connection, yes, but the trust that they have and the understanding that they have together. That he trusts her to safely get Frodo to safety. And this was really funny when I said Neuralim, Asvalaf Neuralim, and then I would kind of kick the horse and he would go forward, but because he was a stallion, he was so feisty, and every time I would be going, Aah! And he'd be sort of taking off, because it was a little stage. It was like a small set. It wasn't a lot of space. And he would just sort of start bolting out into the middle of the sound stage with me on his back, which was terrifying. I spent a lot of time learning how to ride. And um, I love horses. I adore them. But I find it very difficult being actually on top of them, considering that they're a lot bigger and stronger than I am. And I was actually terrified, even when I was just on the back of the, the truck rig, um, and they would have th them actually chasing me. It was absolutely terrifying. They were really convincing and scary. That is the, not actually Elijah, but at times it's Kieran, his scale double, and at other times it was actually just a puppet. Um, I'm not sure what it was made out of, but it would whack me in the lip all the time. That was kind of painful. <laughs> Incredible horse riding, by the way. Amazing. Mm. Very brave horsewoman. What was her name again? Jane? Jane Abbott. And this is the sequence when it comes into close-up that was shot on the stage where I wasn't really looking at anyone but a golf ball. Um, and Kieran was sitting in my lap and he had this mask of Elijah on his face and someone was sitting off to the side and they, in order to make it look real, they used this little remote control to make the eyes open and close so all I could hear was I'm trying to do my lines. And then I'd hear Kieran's cackle, he's like <laughs> underneath. I love what Liv's doing here as well. Mm. You mean conjuring a herd of horses just, out of the water? Yeah, just her performance is so good. I never had any references. I was just completely pretending. This was one of the last effect shots that was completed in the film. So I didn't ever get to see this until I actually went to see the film for the first time. This was actually included in a, in a, a little pickup here. I think they wanted to see really just how sick Frodo was and how, how much she had invested in getting him back to Rivendell to save him. Um, to just show that moment so that it was really, you know, the, the, the audience could really feel just how actually important and scary this moment was. And Elijah um, originally wasn't gonna be able to be there for me in the scene, it was gonna be Kieran and we somehow made the camera angle work so that I could actually have Elijah there with me so I could look at him and act with him in that moment and that really helped me a lot. And it is 10 o'clock in the morning on October the 24th. If you I know. beg to keep that line straight from Tolkien uh, so precise uh, and I also begged to keep him smoking in the what is actually a hospital bedroom. You really shouldn't do that but that's what Tolkien has Gandalf doing in the book, so he does it in the movie. There's an interesting moment in all of this later on. There's a moment where he's with Sam, and he kind of looks off 
out into over Rivendell, and you don't ever see what he's looking at. And we'd shot a sequence where he sees me, and I look up at him, and Aragorn comes and meets me, and you see us have this kind of tender moment, and then walk away. But that little moment didn't end up in the film. So. Now I'd never met Ian, so I had no idea what he was going to be like. Naturally, he's a very amusing man, great sense of humor. And a very nice man. It's an awful phrase, really, to say that somebody's nice. It suggests they're sort of wimpish, you know. But when I say nice, I mean he's a very decent person. He's a very fine actor, and he was tremendously supportive, as far as I was concerned. Encouraging, helpful, and a constant companion, you might say. And that happens very, very rarely. That's why I say, as far as I'm concerned, he's the most cooperative, encouraging, and helpful actor I think I've ever worked with. And I've worked with some very great ones. Eagles, Tolkien's obsession with eagles. Eagles always mm. seem to save the day, you know, in The Hobbit and late here and later on in Lord of the Rings. Eagles are very, very prominent. When I suggested to Sean that he took uh, Elijah's hand, it was because I thought anyone who knew the book would care about the deep friendship, often of a innocently physical nature, and that that might be missed by two resolutely uh, heterosexual actors who mightn't appreciate that gay people like myself uh, saw in a touch something perhaps more meaningful than uh, others might. And so to persuade him to, to touch uh, Elijah, I'd say, well, look, it's in the book. Ian was brought the book over to me right before we shot it, and he said, now look here. It says that Sam runs over and grabs Frodo's hand. He said the fans of the book are going to want to see that. And I sort of, I, I believed it. And I got a fan letter the other day that a, a neighbor friend handed to me, and it said how much it meant to her that the uh, that Sam holds Frodo's hand at that moment because it's, it was something that she... It was one of the most important moments to her in the book. Oh, uh, that's fantastic. So thank it's you. It's those Ian. subtle little nuances, man. That's unbelievable. You can't fake the, the friendship that is self-evident amongst those uh, four young actors. They were just a team. And when I first saw Ian Holm in, in, in his old makeup, he was thrilled to bits. He said, look at this, look what they've done. Uh, he refused to wear a mask, uh, which I think was an original idea. He, he wanted the, it, the paint and, the, and, the, and the, the prosthetics to be actually on his skin. I took one look at him. I said, but Ian, you look exactly like Judy Dench's mother. I think this just, I mean, isn't it incredible, the transformation that he's made from that young Bilbo hobbit to this, this incredibly sort of aged and weathered Hobbit, who now no longer possesses the ring. I just, he's, he's a magical actor. We had a barbecue. We would, we'd always have barbecues and all sorts of sort of get togethers. And there, there was a barbecue around at Billy's house. And, and um, I kind of met Ian for the first time there. And he said, here for 18, what are you going to do when this is over? You know, and you have to go back to reality. And I said, well, what's reality? And he said, yeah, I suppose so. He was like, it's wherever you are and stuff. We had this, he's such a, he's such a sort of um, beautifully eccentric kind of man and he's got so many kind of words of pearls of wisdom and stuff and it was great to talk about like the surreal reality that we were living in out there, you know. Frodo deciding to, uh, to let go of his responsibility of the ring, which I think is really important. It just makes that kind of moment where he takes it at the council that much stronger. Yeah. We did what we said. Frodo and Sam realize that they miss the Shire, they want to go home, and Frodo realizes that, uh, you know, his time with the ring could be could be over, and, and he realizes that, you know, he wants to give it up and, and go back to the Shire. It does a couple of things. For me, it shows that Sam is just so enamored with the idea of the elves when he first hears about them from Gandalf's stories and when, when Frodo tells him, expound, expands on that. And, and so the idea that he's actually in an elf paradise is, uh, is extraordinary for him, especially once Frodo's 
healed and and they can really just enjoy what it's like to be among the elves walking among them and talking to them and wearing their clothes and and uh but but to see that Sam is sort of like that that's all well and good but it's really time to go home now it just shows that it must the journey's really started to take its toll and and um for Frodo to um it also shows what a huge decision it is when you step in when you intervene in the council mm. and they're all bickering among Just themselves makes that a bit heavier and and uh, much more profound when he decides to take the responsibility and, and and take the ring again because you see clearly that it's it's something that he does want to let go of mm-hmm. i love how rivendell is in in con, a constant autumn as well mm. as, uh, as sort of the passing of the um the golden age of the elves their time is coming to an end Oh, here he comes. Hey. It was quite strange, really, because we came together as a group of individuals who didn't know anything or knew very little about each other. And uh, we began to, you know, f- form a trust and a friendship between each other, it's similar to what happened um, in the film with the Fellowship. You know, at first, people are slightly suspicious of each other's motives. And at Boromir, certainly, is suspicious and doubtful of these, of this sort of motley crew. And... Uh, he learns throughout the film. He goes on a quite a fascinating learning curve, um, and he learns to trust these people and realise that you've got to accept and respect their cultures and ideologies. My entrance to the film, that first shot, I had to sort of glide off the horse. I, it was, you know, I was talking about the physicality, and I really wanted just to pop off the horse as if it had just I'd done it a million times before, and then. We tried a few different looks of like looking like looking like really as I as I look around at Rivendell, looking at it with like joy and with like I'm almost as if it's like at home from home, and then with like steely kind of fear about what was um, you know what I was here to talk about, and it was uh, yeah I remember Hugo uh, Weaving is. Uh an actor after my own heart. Uh, he, he, he enjoys working on stage as much as he does uh, on film. And uh, we had long chats together uh, between takes about uh, being a theatre actor in Australia and uh, a theatre actor in the United Kingdom. And yet here we were in this uh, American financed uh, movie uh, in New Zealand. We were both uh, foreigners, but uh, kindred spirit. If either of us looks a little frowningly bewildered, it's because we weren't always entirely sure of what we were going to say next. We found it difficult to learn this scene. It's so much information. I hope our concern looks particular rather than generalised. This is the first time that Aragorn and Boromir meet, and uh, there's a certain tension in the scene that uh, they're still s- testing each other out and uh, there's a lot of respect for each other I think even at this point you know but uh, two similar men in some ways courageous heroic and compassionate I invented Gandalf the Grey I think he's slightly uh, it unsettles him you know when it it falls to the ground and he he stops and he's unsure whether to go back and pick it up or <laughs> and give it the respect it, it deserves, but he's very dubious and very doubtful about the whole thing anyway. But uh, it's quite an interesting moment when he does fall to the ground and it sort of says something, you know. And in this moment, this is Aragorn really feeling the weight and the pressure and just thinking about um, his ancestors and, and what he is and what he, his destiny really, what he, the weight of what he is going to become. And I was supposed to slowly kind of creep up on him, but my dress was a complete beaded gown and it uh, was dragging down, had a kind of a train that drug on the floor, and I was supposed to kind of just appear slowly like an elf, just floating along, but my dress was like (laughs) It was really hard for me to concentrate, but of course, with the the power of cinema, they've completely deleted the sound of that. 
And this is, you know, another moment of seeing how much hope Arwen has. I think it's so hard for Aragorn to give in. You know, he wants to love her and he wants to be with her, but what that means is so painful also at the same time for her to leave her people to be with him, which means that they will eventually both die. But she's saying, I'd rather have a very small amount of time to share those beautiful things with you than forever miserable not having lived that experience. It's interesting because it's really hard, you know, she's, in the next film you see her really trying to fight to keep this great decision that she wants to be with him and she, you know, I choose a mortal life, that's what she says, and you see her really fighting to hold on to that choice because her father and Galadriel, everyone's trying to tell her that, that she can't do that, that men don't love as elf kind do. And, and that's the kind of rebellious streak in, in Arwen that I, I really love and relate to so much. And the idea that, you know, she's over 3,000 years old and the, what you have to see and feel and go through in 3,000 years, I mean, 10 years, 20 years, you see and feel so much pain, but to live for that long. And I, I wanted to play her with a feeling of, of innocence that though she's lived through all of that and and seen so much pain and so much beauty that she can still give herself over completely to this moment and to this relationship with this man. Uh, the the scene that took five days to yeah, shoot. This was a long shoot. <laughs> oh, man. Very stressful. Lots of dwarfs in costumes, five and a half hours in makeup, you know. It feels like we all knew each other's lines by the end of it because we did them that many times. I think you must have said those lines like 500 times One, over or something or more. It was something ridiculous. Bring forth the ring. Narrative challenge to like introduce all these new characters so and I'm... explain what's going on and deal with the. I mean, it's. I mean, uh, even in the book, it's a it's a difficult chapter. I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think this is the point where Boromir realizes that this ring has got a great pull on him, and I think this is the first time he's seen it, as we, as as have we all. But even here, he he can't resist resist it. I think Boromir is, is, is suspicious. I think his nature, he's, he's quite suspicious of other races or other cultures of people because he's had to, he's, him and his family and his father have had to be at the forefront of war and they've had to be realistic about things. So I think Boromir at the beginning is slightly, you know, cynical about all these special powers. I think he feels it's something that could be used as a weapon, you know, as he, um, it's, there's this power there, that is, this power is used wisely, and this could uh, solve, solve these problems that we're having. Um, and the last thing he wants to do is to see it destroyed, you know. He, he believes, I, I think as we all believe, that we can, we can manage the ring, we can overcome its powers, but you can't, you, it's just, it sort of creeps up on you, very subtle and corrupts you. I, I think these additions uh, reversing back to what we actually filmed uh, is an improvement in this scene and uh, the black speech part of it. That's a trick I use over and over again, bringing the staff across my face. I, <laughs> it feels good to do that. It gives a bit of movement even though the, the character's actually still... You know, I don't know if they, I mean, I'm sure the audience appreciates it, appreciates it, but I mean, all of the the background in this, these sort of um, stone carvings and everything, I mean, in any part of any frame that you sort of analyze, if you freeze it and, and look at it, the level of detail and artistry and the set design and the costumes and the props and everything is just so, um, it's just unbelievable. If you were only able to, um, with something like this, actually magnify the image, uh, so that you can actually see uh, a close-up of, of those details. Council of Rivendell is the first point you actually see uh, Gimli, and, uh, and basically he's come because partly he's been summoned and partly be, he's been sent. Uh, he comes very suspicious of the intentions of particularly of the elves. And, and the dwarves are paranoid to a certain extent, hostile to a great extent. Um, 
xenophobic uh, as well. They're there because they, they, they don't wish to give the elves an advantage rather than uh, because they perceive of the great threat of Mordor, I think. And I think as far as Gimli's concerned, it's, it's the moment that he encounters the ring with his axe that he begins to have some idea that he's up against something that is desperately powerful. Because, I mean, he may be a dwarf, but when he swings that axe, you know, it, it could take... It could cleave an orc in two, or uh, you know, it, it's a powerfully, it's a powerful weapon, powerfully swung, and that it actually has not the slightest effect on the ring. Really shakes him. One of you must do this. I love the way he says, "One of you must do this." Well, why don't you do it, mate? <laughs> this page and a half of dialogue was sort of given to me on the on the day. <laughs> on the morning that we started actually filming it. So I was, I was just trying to remember these uh, weird names and these... Uh, so I, I sort of managed to get it in the end, but uh, it was certainly a struggle. But then again, it gives it, it, gives it some sort of spontaneity. You know, it's, good to, it's good not to learn... You know, I think it's always good not to know something too well because it can easily become, sound familiar and, and um, predictable. It's good to have a little bit of uncertainty. And I wasn't certain. <laughs> you know, it, uh, as actors, you can be working on the most sublime material, you know, written by William Shakespeare, let's say, and because you, you say these lines over and over again in various situations when you're hungry or tired, you, 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 can, you can find the whole process uh, ludicrous and, and find yourself giggling. And Sometimes when I see an actor like uh, Hugo being so convincingly concerned about uh, Gimli, son of Gloin, you <laughs> you're very close to parody, but uh, not when you just see it uh, for the first time as an audience. Yeah, the argument scene was a bit... It was strange because I really didn't feel like um, an elf, you know, like Legolas would, would drop himself to a base level of, you know, arguing with these other other races and yet we needed to get something across and and so then I had this thing of you know just sticking my hands out as if to sort of you know just relax my my fellow elves yeah you needed that kind of conflict in order to make this moment play right here with Frodo which is so great I do not know the way Frodo's agreeing to be the ring bearer here we go here's the forging of the fellowship it's great now they form up as a fellowship. It's really, hero you know, real boy's own stuff in it, heroic. And my axe. <laughs> that moment of just like, oh God, not the dwarf. I thought that the w the one way we could keep the tension between the elf and the dwarf for as long as possible was for me to be a slight bit standoffish with him, so that he wouldn't fall into that trap that. That young actors <laughs> and old actors frequently do. Because you like the actor you're playing with, you actually play with a little less tension sometimes, or a little less of a dagger to the throat. Actually, in, in truth, it wasn't necessary. I, I mean, he he grew so much as an actor as he went uh, as he went through the piece, and it was uh, it, it was a joy to behold it. Yeah, you know, it's funny because people always talk about, oh, so you must have formed a great relationship with John Reese davies and everything. And I, and I did, yeah, I love John. He's a great guy. But really, I did most of my work with Brett Beatty because of the scale issue, you know. I mean, John's about three, three inches taller than I am. Welcome back. Welcome to the second disc. Welcome back. It's Ian McKellen again with the cast audio commentary continuing for The Fellowship of the Ring. It was great working with Vigo. He gives you so much, you know, as an actor, he's, he's, he's always seeking the truth in, in a situation and he won't do it unless he believes it's true, you know, he, he's that sort of guy. Um, a lot of integrity and a, and a really soulful quality about him um, as a person as well as an actor. And uh, I was just pleased to have him around when I was doing certain scenes like the death scene and. Um, you really feel you're in there with him, you really feel it's, it's real. Yeah. If you cast right, you've done about 80% of your work 
with the actors because uh, there are so many other technical demands and the demands of the schedule, the demands in your time and things like that. It's a sign of a very experienced and very accomplished um, director. And uh, though I, I'm told that Fran did an awful lot of the casting and uh, uh, all I can say is it was spot on and Peter was certainly right to trust her instincts. There's Mrs. Dench again. And when I say Ian Holm as very old Bilbo looks like Judy Dench's mother, I mean it literally. He, uh, uh, Olaf Dench was a formidable uh, woman and uh, I, I knew her when Judy Dench and I were, were young actors working together. <laughs> this moment coming up freaks so many people out. It's, mm. it's such a great thing. Isn't it? Seamless blend of just great acting and special effects. It was just laying in two shots, because they did. Uh, they shot Ian there, and then they shot the puppet that they had made of. of and sort they of morph a, it. Yeah, and they morphed it together. I love the way his eyes bulge. What did Ian actually do in the take? Did he just do that? He he did the kind of as much as he could. Very, very, very cool. Yeah, because I remember when that puppet was around, uh, when they were still working on it, and uh, I was saying, what is that for? You know, I couldn't think where in the script it would be, and, and when they, they told me and they said it will probably be on screen for, like, less than a second, and they'd been working on it for months, you know, incredible. and, it, yeah, the detail is incredible. Mm. It's a beautiful puppet. Yeah. The other the other thing that I, I found so astonishing out there was the... Um, the depth and the quality of the behind-the-scenes preparation. You know, the costume department, the workshops, the armory, the, you know, the welding going on, the grinding, the hammering of leather. I've, I've worked on some pretty major productions, but it seems to me that the in-depth preparation and quality of every department involved in this film was nothing less than first class. I don't know how they did that, because I wasn't there when, uh, when they shot this. I was at home in England. <laughs> so I don't know how I got in that scene. But there's, there's quite a few moments where you see yourself, and I knew for a fact that I was home. I wasn't in New Zealand. I was home doing something else. And uh, you see that, you know, we, the, the sort of digitally formed Boromirs, you know, running around. Oh, look at that. I go to the left or the right? Left. left. <laughs> it just brings everything down to a human level of... It's reflected later in the story when they're in Moria. Um, do we go to the left or the right? Crucial decision. This scene was something we shot also back in the beginning and the sort of the other Arwen character, the two split personalities of Arwen. Um, so you can see by kind of, I think for me when I'm watching it, just by the way I'm playing it, you can see there's something more vulnerable, I suppose, and weaker about her and, and her reaction to what's happening, as opposed to just a very strong bond and understanding between the two of them that they would have. But it's a, it's a nice little moment there. There was, um, there was talk very early on uh, in kind of, as a joke of elvish women weeping because Mary and Pippin were leaving because they're, you know, we've, we've been kind of their sugar daddies for the last and, few, yeah. few weeks that we've been hanging around there. And we like the idea that some of them might be pregnant and stuff. Yeah. Holding onto their tummies, going, don't go, don't, don't go. go. It's okay, we'll try and be back in nine months' time. For some reason, Pete never went for that. Yeah. We got to this location by helicopter. This is the setting of another uh, safety issue with Sean. Oh, goodness. Remember the helicopter? Yeah, well, we were on top of this mountain and they set, they send the helicopter. Well, you go ahead, you go ahead and tell how silly I was. Well, I think, Dom, you, you were there as well. Mm. Yeah, Sean just, you know, he's very safety conscious and, and, and while we were, uh, you know, just hanging around, relaxing and, and taking it easy, Sean spent about an hour directing helicopters no. towards us. No, I didn't. <laughs> and, no, it, and, it, and I'd just yes, like to say that they all landed safely. Yeah, they all... They were so all... he did a good job. I remember once, Sean, we, <laughs> me and you went to see a rugby game. Do you remember that? Yeah. And we were just sitting watching the rugby game and I could see Sean looking around and I turned to him and I said... You're actually looking for ways out in case there's a disaster, aren't you? And he said, yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> All eventualities covered. Hey, Always. I had absorbed Sam's sort of pragmatism into my soul at that point. <laughs> It was important to me, and I always said to Pete as well, that um, you know, Legolas should be the first to see these things, the first to name it or see it or be aware of these things, you know, so he kind of moves off and stares to the distance first because I think um, my role as Legolas in the Fellowship really, um, it became, he becomes really the eyes and ears of the Fellowship. You know, he's like, he's the first to... Um, to be aware of danger around him, you know, with his elven qualities, he can, he can, um, it can come into his consciousness before, before the others. You feel a bit silly, you know, crouching behind these rocks, uh, pretending to be out of sight. As long as you're out of sight from the camera, you're allow. Well, here's a reference to the birds, you know, by uh, Hitchcock. And we all came out on cue. Someone was shouting up here. I like this look of Gandalf. He looks as if he could survive in the open air. The thing is, is the elves don't feel the cold, so I'd be in all these locations with just everything, the same gear that I had on in every, every, every shot and every location, you know. But, you know, I, I, but, but I can't show that because, you know, he's an elf and he doesn't feel the extremities, he doesn't feel the cold. And... Sean's performance is so interesting because he is normally such, he is such a lean, mean, killing machine. He's, he's, you know, such a positive, strong character normally. And there's a sort of shame-faced deceitfulness in some of, the, of this character as he plays it. There's a man not wholly happy with himself, a man actually quite corrupted, um, and yet a man who ultimately redeems himself. And that's what I found interesting about playing Boromir is that, you know, the, the, this inner struggle, you know, he's a, he's a warrior, he's valiant, he's strong physically, but the battle that he can't face is the battle within himself. That's, that's what he can't fight. And you see his soul sort of decaying and this fine man, uh, he sort of takes away his soul and I suppose by the end he, he comes to realise that he's been on a hell of a learning curve and that the, the only way he could possibly be redeem himself is in battle, which he throws himself into. You know, there's little moments like that just show show exactly this, like as he releases the tension, takes his hand off the sword, because it's the attention to that detail. And this shot, look at this shot, isn't this shot amazing? How it just drops into this miniatures and then pulls right up on onto to Christopher Lee here. So, man, I mean, I, I just remember seeing that in the cinema and it feels like you're on a roller coaster ride, really going through the location, through the sets. This was filmed inside the studio, and the snow was, was made up of polystyrene balls which got everywhere into every single orifice, and it was extremely unpleasant. It, uh, it was a mixture of polystyrene and, and, and real snow, which was uh, created in the refrigerator and then dumped onto the, the ledge. It was disgusting. It was blasted in my eyes. But the thing is, being the elf, you know, he doesn't feel the cold, so he doesn't... So I had to just, as if, as if I wasn't, you know, it wasn't affecting me. I had to be staring out and seeing and, you know, nothing was affecting me. And yet it was so uncomfortable, I can't even tell you. It was just dirty, man, the, the whole atmosphere, you know, because it was like this stuff was being blasted around and this weird dust stuff and it was, oh. Oh, this was so miserable. The, the, uh, the styrofoam, the polystyrene styrofoam snow. snow. So that when you take a one like minor deep breath in, it would coat the inside of your throat and nostrils. And, and it, just... it kind of <laughs> melted, didn't it? It sort of melted. Well, myself and Dom were on set the whole day, but they never got to our um, I think three days shot. Running. Yeah, and they end up they had to do our shot later on in real snow. In real snow, up a mountain, and when we finished, we were both given a shovel each, and we sat on the shovel and then sledged all the way down to the bottom of the mountain. That was How fast. far down did you guys so, I think 7,000 feet or something like that. It was, about, was more than that. It was about 100 metres. <laughs> wow, it was great fun, though. Brilliant. It was really good fun. And then that was actually, you know, that shot there was actually filmed in the snow for me. So I was buried under a ski slope. They dug out a hole. It was on a ski field. It was hilarious. It was a Sunday, so the fields were closed and we just dug a hole and got in there and then I had to bust, literally bust my way out with my head. Yeah, yeah, they buried, buried us in, uh, in snow. We were buried, buried in polystyrene up to the sort of head and then they just filled, 
cover the top of your head with, with, with real snow so that, you know, you're really warm down the bottom, then your head's freezing on top. <laughs> and we just did it again and again and again. Typical Jackson storytelling, uh, the magnificence of, of the effect of the, of the uh, snow avalanche and then coming in very, very close where all that matters is the actor's eyes. The contrast between the, the long shot and the extreme close-up. On all these shots, you can see the difference in character and the difference in each actor's thinking about his character and thinking about his response, which is why it's, it's such an all-round ensemble piece. As I say, I don't think there are any weak performances in this. So Poor John. <laughs> I think it was what, after every day of makeup that he had, uh, he had to have at least four days off to yeah. recover in terms of his face and what that would do. Because the prosthetics <clears throat> and the glue and the, and the plastics and stuff it would, was really eating into his skin, into mm. his face. Must yeah. have been really miserable. It was, it was so physically disfiguring that, I mean, I really became very insular and very, very paranoid and very, uh, very much a loner. You know, I didn't really want to go out with other people. I didn't want to have dinner with other people. I, 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 I wanted to keep to myself because I was ashamed of what I looked like. And I, I guess that, um, you know, the fun, of, the real fun of being an actor is being with other actors on a set. You know, getting giddy with tiredness on a set at night when there's a beautiful moon and you're in, and you're you're miles from anywhere, and and uh, and sharing that great camaraderie, just the fooling around on set, the the setting tricks, the daily pranks, and things like that, the telling of wild and improbable tales, and that great thing that ha that happens between older actors and younger actors, the passing on of the folklore of, you know, of, of Burton and Taylor meeting at the Savoy with Peter O'Toole in tow, and uh, I mean, all those wonderful great tales that, that are handed on from one generation of actor and sort of grow and magnify, and, and that sort of communion is so, it, it's so enriching and so valuable. Now, in the book, it's Mary that solves the riddle. In the film, they, they gave it to uh, Frodo. Lunatics. Is it? I, yeah. I can't remember that. Yeah, it's yeah. Mary that works in it. He does have that kind of mind, Mary, actually. It's funny that mm. you say that. Yeah. I remember being a, a, a little bit miffed. Were you a little miffed? Mm, I was a little miffed. You didn't express that to me. No, I, well, I wouldn't express it to you, Elijah. It wasn't your concern. I'm sorry, Nate. Did you go straight to the talk? I spoke to the filmmakers and I said, why? Why has this happened? And they said, we want more of Elijah and less of you. <laughs> so, you know, it made They sense. said the same thing to me. <laughs> this slightly prolonged version, that I think, is an improvement on what you see in the, in, in the first version of the film because uh, it, it just shows that Gandalf doesn't quite know what he's doing. Uh, <laughs> and that's the point of the fellowship, that they help each other out. Um, Mary gives the uh, clue in the way he... Uh, says the word friend to Gandalf in the in the book, or, but in the film version it's uh, Frodo who solves the puzzle, and it's a good bit of storytelling because if it hadn't taken Gandalf so long to open that damn door, then um, that stone wouldn't have disturbed the Watcher, who threatens their existence any minute now. Uh, Gandalf uh, uh, has a staff. Uh, anyone who tramps the countryside at his age uh, would need something to lean on. It is um, crafted from um, a small branch of a tree, wouldn't you say? Or maybe it's a, a, a sapling and, and those are its roots entangled uh, at the top. And in that entanglement, uh, I think I decided that, that it'd be good to slip the, um, the pipe so it, it was always ready. Where else would he, he, he keep it? When we get to, to Moria, uh, the staff has changed uh, because into the cluster of, of uh, confused, knotted wood at the top uh, slips a crystal which uh, can light up. For the actor, of course, they, they were often different. Uh, sometimes I was allowed to use a, a lightweight staff um, made of a lightweight uh, wood, which was easy to, to carry. Sometimes uh, I 
don't know for what reason it had to be a heavier staff which would withstand perhaps uh, journeying over r rocky ground and so on and then in Moria uh, it was a more complicated staff still because the electric uh, electricity providing the light in the crystal uh, was actually uh, provided via a wire that came out of the bottom of the staff uh, into a uh, a battery that I, I was carrying under my voluminous uh, costume. This was hard work. <laughs> it was really cold in there, and it was winter, and uh, me and uh, me and Vigo were in there at night shooting as well. It was absolutely freezing, and uh, we were just fighting thin air, uh, just somebody dangling a ball, you know, and you're sort of slashing at it. The, 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 all this wasn't there, you know, it's just put in afterwards, so we were just slashing at thin air and chopping off imaginary tentacles. As Aragorn and Boromir fight the, uh, the Watcher, I, I, I sat in this flooded car park watching them battling with a non-existent monster, and, uh, oh, I was glad I wasn't playing their parts at that point. That's the first time you see me shoot a boat, I think. I trained for about um, two months, not specifically on archery, but um, predominantly. And also, you know, there was horse riding and, and sword play as well. Obviously, you know, he's an elf, so whatever he sort of picks up in terms of weapons he can use and make play in an incredible way. So I wanted to make sure that I did that. You know, I wanted to, I wanted to really make it real and believable. Yeah, I got quite used. We all got quite used to our uh, our arms and weapons, and uh, you know we were quite good at the end with them. You know, quite quite skillful. But they were beautiful weapons. You know, they were, they were so well made, and uh, and they're all different. We all had our different styles of combat and fighting, and that's what made it good. You know, it's uh, there is an indiv individuality to the to the style of the the fights. Sean Bean wasn't present for a lot of these. Um a lot of the Moria sequence. Mm -hmm. Remember, he he had to leave for a little oh God, while. Yeah, of course. We had his double there. But you know, I was there for most of the time. I flew home a couple of times, and it's very difficult to fly home because your head's still back in New Zealand. You know, you you're still thinking about that. So it's, you know, when you're working a job for this long, you get very involved with it. And uh, and we got involved with each other. We we made some good friends, and uh, and we still you know we, we still see each other a lot now because we're always bumping into each other at various functions and premieres. But it did help strengthen that fellowship, you know, the bond that we created in our in our our, our own lives it helped us to create this bond that the fellowship have, you know, and it's, it's almost real because that's what was happening to us at the time. We were getting to know each other. We didn't know each other, but in time, we really, you know, thought a lot about each other. And this friendship and this respect has lasted into their private lives, with some of them, I know that. Not so much with me in terms of friendship, because I didn't do anything like as much as all the other people in the film did. You see, they were on and off in it for something like 15 months. So they formed a real bond, as I would have done too, if I'd been their age. Well, the younger members of the company bonded together so wonderfully well. You know, they went out together, they were, they were good together, and they were very naughty together. And, and they had such a wonderful time, and it really, it really helped to, to create that wonderful camaraderie that should exist. And it was very interesting to see Sean and, um, and Vigo, uh, they, would, uh, they would quite frequently go out to dinner or go out together, uh, you know, because they're of the same sort of age and, and, you know, have the same sort of interests. There was really only one curmudgeon that didn't do any socialising at all, and, and that was this paranoid dwarf with no skin on around his eyes I, and i've never felt on um, uh, so self-conscious uh, as i as i was on on this uh, on this production and uh, when you're a working actor and you live so far away from home home and regularity is what keeps you sane you see so many times you know good responsible actors where 12 weeks in athens you know they've got 10 days work to do spread over 12 weeks great so we'd explore Greece and, uh, you know, and the first two days they do the museums. And then they're, they're in their little rooms and they're slowly getting lonelier and lonelier. So, you know, then it's nine o'clock at night while the crew's back and washed and all that sort of thing, down to the bar, have a, have a jolly with the rest of them. 
you know, and then that nine o'clock becomes a six o'clock, and then that six o'clock becomes a midday. You know, you suddenly see people literally falling apart in front of your eyes. If it's not alcohol, it can be drugs. My form of conjuration to keep me sane is I, I, I pick a hobby, a new hobby, preferably, when I go away for these very, very long shoots. And this time it was going to be boating. Um, I ended up with five boats, by the way. I'm very taken with this little bit of philosophy about the importance of pity, the importance of being sympathetic to uh, someone who might, in appearance, be alien to you. These are important human values, and uh, playing good characters isn't always as easy as playing bad ones, because... Uh, the devil has the best tunes, but here, this is some of Tolkien's best, most profound, and yet simple uh, writing, and um, therefore it makes it easier to act a good character, two good characters here. really encapsulates the story. <clears throat> the wizard teaching the hobbit about the value of all life. Mm. One of the reasons you see so little of Gollum in this first film is because they haven't, at that point, worked out how, how to make Gollum believable. I loved this set. It was difficult to walk around as it needed to be. You had to watch his step. In which case, you also were meant. We had to imagine the vastness of this place uh, in the cramped studio in Wellington. So the first time I saw it was when the audience saw it in the completed film. It's a pity, isn't it, it never really existed. Tolkien basically said this is, a, this is an English or a British myth that he was writing. And we wanted to try and give each of the uh, different races a different part of England where they came from. And we decided that the, uh, the Shire folk should have that slight, you know, Somerset come Loamshire sort of accent. That the Elvish, which Tolkien talks about a couple of times, I think there are almost two forms of Elvish, one of which he, he thought was very akin to the Welsh. And, and so there is a lot, a certain amount of the Welsh lilt in, in Elvish talk. And I felt that the, the sort of contentiousness and bloody-mindedness of, of the dwarves needed a slightly truculent sort of accent. And for, for better or worse, I picked on a sort of Scottish accent, which seemed to work. It seemed, it, you know, it seemed to work. But it heightens the differences between the, the different races of, of, uh, on the earth at the time. This was like, um, within the last six months of filming, I think we shot this sequence in Balanced Tomb. And it was a dusty, dirty kind of um, set um, that got very hot and sweaty because of all the fight sequences that had to go on in, bolt in, in there. And um, it was a real undertaking, you know. I remember thinking, you know, Pete got us all together for, um, for a chat about the sequence because it was so involved, you know, with the, with the cave troll, which was this new <clears throat> uh, beast that we were to encounter who was going to be completely... Um, a complete CGI kind of special effect, visual effect. It needed a lot of very um, close attention to detail of movement so that, you know, there was a sort of floor map for the cave troll in which it would, you know, move around. And Randy Cook was, was great, you know, he this was really his area. Um, he really um, he really came into his own here and kind of, you know, he kind of had to sort of direct parts of what was going on so that we were aware of um, when that when the cave troll attacks me and he has his anvil and his chain and the whip and stuff I would duck down and then spring up and stuff and 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 Randy would be like no 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 you've got to go lower because we've got to show the chain going across and otherwise it'll take your head off sort of thing it was quite an intimidating um, prospect filming this one this sequence because there was so much involved it was such a big setup I'll never forget the Saturday morning and we were all to meet uh, at the stage, yeah. and Peter Jackson 
uh, sort of arrived a little bit later than the rest of us, but all of the actors were there for the from the fellowship. All of the stunt doubles were there. All of the scale doubles were there. That's all right. of the digital technicians were there, and we all show up. And then Peter walks in and just describes and acts out. You could see him adopt the mannerisms of each member of the fellowship and of the cave troll while he was acting it out. It was incredible. It was it was awesome. And then he basically went on to direct other stuff. And one of the biggest achievements in the movie is that other people, Jeff Murphy and yeah. John Mahaffey, John Mahaffey were left to sort of direct and capture the vision that he laid out on that Saturday, while Peter was off work directing other stuff. And it's a, it's extraordinary. Fool of a took. A line like fool of a took. It looks very pleasing on the page. Fool and uh, took are almost the same word because the took is a fool. Uh, and in saying it too, you're alert to the fact that the way the words look the same and have the same sound, the same vowel sound. Uh, it's a little uh, technical accomplishment of Tolkien uh, and, and it's witty too. Uh, but it's within the language uh, and the preciseness of the language that uh, the point is made. You don't need a long speech when you've got a phrase as elegant and funny as that. I love what happens here. The fellowship really starts to come into their own. You know, everyone gets their swords out. And it's a, just the most adventurous, exciting. And it, I, I think the audience don't know whether the hobbits are going to fight or not. And then that shot right that there. That was the coolest. Tells, you know, they are, they are so involved. They don't mind dying for this cause. This is quite a scary moment because you just don't know what's going to come through the door, do you? This is great. For the first time, you see the Fellowship fighting as the Fellowship together. I love this moment in the film. Orlando Bloom, the single coolest archer in the history of cinema. Yeah. He worked really hard at all that as well. And he, he became really good at, um, I think, particularly the knife work that he had to do. Yeah. The spinning of the knives. And he really kind of took on that whole assassin role, which was wicked. My, the level of jealousy I feel towards Orlando Bloom for how good-looking he is and how swift he is with all of his weaponries <laughs> exists on many levels. <laughs> hey, beauty in the, is in the eye of the beholder. Hey, hey look, well, at, look at I, you go I, here, Sean. yourself. You look kind of sexy here, Sean, when you when you run out. I think everybody got, you know, we all got knocks and coats and stuff like that. It's, it's, you know, but it was very well choreographed and uh, what a great fight director, There's Bob Anderson and Greg Powell and and the stunt team, you know, the girls and the guys were fantastic, you know, they just threw themselves into it, very professional, very precise. So we were, we were in good company there. I, I like the cave troll uh, uh, as a character and it's what makes this um, seem particularly convincing, I think, that he's, uh, there are two sides to any quarrel and, and uh, what has the cave troll done to deserve all this? <laughs> um, and, to be tortured so before he finally succumbs. We did so much uh, choreography with the stunt guys, and it was, and it seemed like, well, we're not going to get a chance to do any of it. And then we got into this thing, and they really let us just go. There are lots of mutual defense uh, moments in, in, in throughout the thing that um, that begins to show them working together as a, as a team. They had these plastic explosives in the walls all around me so that they would blow up to show where, you know, as, as, the, as the whip came across, you'd see there's a little line of explosions going off. So I was standing there and I had this stuff just blasting in my face. And then there was that, the, the sequence where I run up over the cave troll. They had a scaffolding. So they, they did me running up over this scaffolding and then I had my legs between this big box. They CG'd my legs in. So they had my upper body moving up from this scaffolding thing, but they have my legs, which they put in, and then when I was standing on top of the cave troll, it was like the, my legs, they weren't my legs, they were like some CG thing, and um, and the, the upper body was me standing on top of this scaffolding thing, so the visual effects and the special effects team just came together to make to make an, a fantastic sequence. Peter showed us uh, the, um, you know, like a, a graphic, give us a Sort of idea of what it would look like on a computer, you know, you had the, the outline of the cave troll and and so you, you sort of could figure out what you were supposed to be fighting and imagine what you were fighting, but they just used a big long stick with a ping pong ball on the end and that was your sort of focus of attention and that's what we, uh, that's what we were fighting really, I suppose, you know, until it all gets put together and you think, God, oh, thank God it's all. <laughs>
it looks like we're really fighting someone, something. Because, you know, you just have to pretend, you know, we were pretending so much of the time against these creatures. But he was always, he's always, he's always really very clear, Peter. He's very, um, he makes it, he's visualised it for you. And, he, and any given time he could talk about a character or, or anything to do with a story, it was like a, amazing. And you knew how each character was feeling and, and what they were thinking. And uh, he was always very clear and very, very humorous as well. And uh, I think we all respected him very much. So you've never, you never, never really left in the dark. You always had an idea of what you, what you were fighting, even though it was thin air. You know, you've, uh, you used to have little models and toys and shows you what they might do and things like that. As mean and bad as the cave troll is, there's something in his eyes and the expression of the way the digital artist sort of rendered him that he, he just looks so sad. I mean, he's just as much a victim as anybody else when he exactly. gets dragged around. I always feel really bad for him when he dies at the end. He just has that look, that sort of surprised kind of when, when Legolas gets him through the mouth, you know? He just kind of, what what happened? Why? Oh, and he, he doesn't falls. know, does he? He's been tortured by, you know, the other guys for so long that he just... So the orcs who had him? Yeah, he just doesn't oh. know what's going on. Poor guy. He's overwhelmed. It's all these people running around with swords and bright, yeah. shiny things. I mean, he's scary, but he's sad. The cave troll doesn't have any language to uh, express his situation. We don't know where he's come from or what he's fighting for except survival. And so I think it's appropriate that there should be something uh, uh, pathetic and melancholy about his uh, death. I mean, what would you do if you were a cave troll and you were invaded? I never thought of it like that, but I suppose it is kind of sad because he's kind of just a slave anyway, isn't he? He's a slave to the orc. Um, a secret about the mithril vest. I never wore a full chain mail vest. It was a it was a bit of a cheat because for some reason they didn't they didn't make they made one full one, but I think for for costume reasons and not wanting to mess up the full chain mail, they had like a tight T-shirt, and then they kind of grafted the chain mail, the front of the chain mail, onto the t-shirt, so I never actually wore a full mithril vest. This involved us uh, running up and down the empty studio uh, with a blue screen on which eventually would be cast these uh, striking images. I don't believe any of us really knew what we were doing or how effective it was going to look uh, when it was all pieced together. It's the sort of day in which actors stand around and gossip and um, ask, when's it going to be lunch? But I think those, uh, the, the wide shots when we're all running there, it's fantastic how, how well the motion capture mm. uh, works because everyone's running completely. Like, it looks like Elijah run, you know? Yeah, yeah. Is, is, you mean the stride length? Yeah, everything, you different. know, it's not nine kind of similar characters. Everyone has their own motion. Yeah, mm. yeah, relative to their size. Now, what I was hoping there was when I said, when I was snarling, you know, was, and, and lo and behold, after I snarl, they're all filled with consternation and they run away. Right? So I think I can permit myself a little, <laughs> you know, that'll show them. <laughs> you know. Well, there you go, you see. I mean, they managed to find moments that could come directly from the book, make them play in the movie, and they found enough of them to really make readers of the book feel like they weren't being cheated, you know, which they weren't. Obviously, this is a movie, you couldn't have had all the information, but it was well thought out, you know, it was enough, there were enough of those moments that came directly from the book that, that made you really feel like you were watching, you know, the book come to life. I mean, that is a g genuine shot of us running away. What I was doing, the floor was there, so I was, I was going to pr pretend that I was falling into a really big chasm. You think, what would I do in this situation if I was on the edge of a precipice? How would, I, how would my arms go to balance myself up? So. I had to keep saving Sean Bean on that shot, yeah? I had to keep running up behind him and grabbing him, and he killed, just, he just fall back onto me, and I was fall, had such a bruised backside and legs after that, because he just kept just, like, falling back on me, and I was like a nice soft pillow for him to land on as I grabbed him and pulled him back. I gave him a few beatings for that, I can tell you. 
the, these daring jumps uh, were just simply jumping from one platform to another, you know, um, 18 inches off the ground. Uh, and uh, I had very little sense of uh, what it was going to look like in, in, in its scale. We were, we were on some steps, on some stairs, but it wasn't that high, it was maybe 20 foot high. Uh, and the camera was underneath us. It was just a matter of keeping your feet because the stairs were really narrow as well. So as long as you could keep on your feet and just try and convince yourself that you're, you know, you're on the edge of a, a staircase that's about to crumble and fall to your death. Kieran and PK, we, th we threw them quite a bit. And we had little dummies as well, which on the mountainside I was carrying on, under each arm, one in it, under each arm. Hobbit in each arm. We threw the hobbits a few times. It's always throwing them around. <laughs> Nobody tosses a dwarf. <laughs> we, 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 the, the dwarf tossing thing was a. It, it evolved from our, our basic sort of sense of mischief, since we knew that uh, the jump was too big for him. But the pride of the dwarf was necessarily there, and I, we did a version with and without it. It was a little contemporaneous reference that we could make that would that would help to sort of um, take the the, the 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 high terror out of it and just add a little note of real life to it in a way. When I first saw uh, this um, moment when Aragorn and Frodo make the final leap and and behind them the whole structure collapses. I thought, uh, he's never going to be able to top this. Uh, Peter Jackson's blown it. Um, surely this is a scene about the Balrog and rather than about crumbling architecture. But, <laughs> of course, what he's simply doing is, is uh, tightening the screw and the tension. Initially, they were going to try and, and photograph, uh, and they did, actually, shots of, um, of real fire against black but during the, because of the length of time um, that it took to make these movies, uh, during the production, they, a guy actually wrote the program for CG Flame. Yeah. All oh, right. Yeah. What? Oh, While, so they had an idea of doing it. Yes. And then they changed it because, because the technology. Some, <laughs> some guy made a program for well, CG Flame. Isn't wrote, that amazing? They wrote the code. They had tw like 200 guys writing their own code that was not available like on the market for people to just buy yep. films. And they're continuing to innovate, innovate it now, even for two and three. The, the, the technology is getting even better and smarter. We, there's actually quite a lot of innovation associated with this movie. The, the massive uh, engine is incredibly innovative in terms of the AI for the wide shots of armies kind of running around. Here he comes. I accepted uh, the offer to impersonate one of the great uh, icons of um, my lifetime without realising what, in a sense, an honour uh, it was, uh, simply on, on the basis of Peter Jackson and Fran Walsh's own enthusiasm for the material. I had not read the book. I was excited by the designs that they brought to my house in London, where I live. I'd never been to their country uh, and wasn't prepared for the impact that the whole experience was going to have on me. Uh, and the great uh, changing... Uh, Moments, if you can call a year a moment. His flaming bullwhip is the coolest thing. Yeah. Do you think when Tolkien wrote all this stuff, he knew how difficult it was going to be to film? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Well, if I could sit down with the man, I'd ask him about why they had to be big furry feet. Exactly. As I was doing this, I didn't believe it. I kept saying to Peter, no, 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 nobody can hang on by his fingernails like that. It's just not possible. So the moment was held as briefly as possible be to make it credible. Brother, you fools. Though I think it was I who pleaded for one last look in close-up between Gandalf and Frodo as the two friends part forever. I think the loss of Gandalf was like losing a parent. It felt like as long as Gandalf was there, nothing too bad could go wrong. 
you know, because he, he knows everything. And it's like when you're a, a kid and, and your dad's there. You think nothing too bad can go wrong. No matter what's happening, he's kind of, you know, he's kind of all-knowing or whatever. And I think Pippin feels that way. And when Gandalf goes, that's a real kind of moment. I remember I was saying to Pete, for the first time, Legolas witnesses death or what death does to the beings around him. He doesn't understand that. It's not part of his comprehension. He's an elf. Elves don't die, they're immortal. And so he's sort of, I wanted to try and portray in that, that moment this kind of utter confusion and bewilderment at Gandalf not being with us. And where could he have gone? This is what death means, you know. I love the look in Orlando's eyes. He's like, wow, look at their faces. Such confusion in his eyes. I love that. Give them a moment, for pity's sake. By nightfall, these hills will be swarming with orcs. Remember, the original line for him was, pretty soon the, the hills will be fair teeming with orcs. Fair teeming. Fair teeming. Was it? Yeah. Yeah. On your feet, sir. I think Eric Gordon knows that we've got to carry on. Um, I just want them to have time to rest, but it's a real blow. I, I didn't really want to go on the helicopter to, uh, to this particular location, <laughs> and uh, I asked Peter if it was okay if I got there by other means, and so I walked for quite a long way, for about half an hour, and then, it, you know the ski lift thing where you sit in the cars and they take you up on a pulley, and I got off that <laughs> and walked for about another half an hour up these up mountainsides, it was like mountaineering. And the helicopter came over at one point. I think they all saw me climbing, like Boromir in costume, climbing <laughs> up this mountain to get to the set because I was terrified of going in the helicopter, but it must have been quite a sight. He's a very fearless little chap, except when it comes to the irrational and, you know, this, this elf witch that can bewitch, you know, takes away, essentially, once you see her, you're captivated and that's it. We were trying to get the look right for Legolas, and I'd been working with Nyla on on the costume. You know, obviously she we'd been discussing colours, and you know we'd all been it'd been a, the great thing about working on this project that it was a real collaborative effort, and you know you really felt like you had a part in it in the process, which was great. So this first outfit though, it was like it been. I mean, you can imagine the beginning of filming. There's so many characters to establish and so many different costumes and things that it just kind of got to the last minute, and we hadn't quite locked down what exactly I was going to wear and the look of it. So it's quite amusing to see this this scene back in the film because it was, this costume was just not what I was wearing for the rest of the whole movie, you know. It's like I had one day in it and I was like, we decided to go for a more kind of tailored kind of look, you know, more kind of put together in that way. And this was like, this just didn't work. That was so funny, that moment, because John couldn't remember the line, he couldn't pronounce it. It was like, you know what this dwarf says there? Ishkar, what does he say? <laughs> it was, and you know what the dwarf says there? Hoshkal, oh, bollocks. He was hilarious. And there was um, no a different makeup thing for, for Gimli, which um, was an early... You were talking about the evolution of Gimli's look. Yeah, there, well, there was an evolution. They'd kind of done this thing with... Um, regular, uh, I believe, latex prosthetics, and um, they saw how it looked in, in dailies and weren't happy with it, so they decided they decided to go for gelatin. Mm -hmm. The makeup wasn't quite right. It really wasn't quite the way that Peter wanted it, and they hadn't finally settled on it. Um, it works, but it's not totally a different character. But uh, it was as a result of the sequence that we went back to the drawing board and added more hair and subtracted a bit more of this and built the nose up. And um, I think at basically the eye bags, the accursed eye bags were modified at that point. And um, it became quite a, uh, quite a piece of work. And also you could see John's face, John Reese davies face. They were, they were, it was losing his sort of individual bone structure and stuff and they wanted to keep it. So that was a little bit of a work in progress. That was the first scene with John, I think. Well. I love to tease John. Every time he'd walk onto the set, I was like, Indy, they're digging in the wrong place. <laughs> Asps, very dangerous. You go first. And I remember one day he said to me, you know, Sean, 
could border on parody. <laughs> nice sort of thought. Uh oh. Okay, sorry, John. Remember the special Galati light they used? Yes. I love it. It's such a cool. The Galati light was this um, circular housing for these different lights that they used, and when they would hold it up, um, it just it it generated light in a very specific and particular way that that was supposedly come. You know, when she, when Galadriel was around, this is how we when we were first introduced to her. It kind of she emanates this this sort of mystic energy and light, and and so they would hold the light up to us, and it was amazing because you'd be standing there and and you'd see what it looked like on playback without it, and then they'd hold it up, and it just completely um, created this 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 feeling, this this energy, and and uh, this look that was so so cool. Kate Blanchett, she is, she is Galadriel. She is an elf. I mean. There is something quite powerful and timeless and sophisticated and pure and but there is a real intense. strength and yeah intensity and a, and a real power to her as well working with with Kate Blanchett was it was was amazing she um she had uh, such incredible poise and focus and um posture and just you know her her presence for for Gladriel it was just perfect. I was kind of, I was really nervous to work with her, actually. Yeah. Yeah, oh man. Because <laughs> I have the utmost respect for her, and she's got this kind of energy. But I'm also just, ma I, she's so beautiful. Yeah, yeah she's kind so of just uh, taken by the So feminine. Like, yeah. So feminine. The idea is that Galadriel can read, um, can read our minds, our thoughts. So she goes through the fellowship and, um, and takes from their mind what is going on, you know, their feelings, their what their their relationship to the ring, and how they um, how they are kind of coping with the uh, with the journey of the fellowship. It's almost like it's 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 um, preempting in a way what is to come in a, in a way, you know, because Boromir obviously is the first to be really taken by the ring, and she she kind of sees. It's like a warning sign, you know, that you get in life, and um, you know she's kind of she she's like predicts what's happening. I think it's some kind of release for Boromir. I think she can see right into his soul, and uh, and he knows that, and the potential for evil that is sort of lingering there, and he can't hide it from her. She can see that. She can see that he could be a danger to the Fellowship, and. I think it's just a release of the tension and the the hurt that Boromir has been feeling there. It just comes out because he knows that she she's seen this thing in him, and uh, which makes it easier to to uh, discuss with Aragorn, the, you know, the, the situation with um, Gondor and my people. But it is a very scary moment for Boromir. I think this, you know. It's, and somebody really looks into you and they know it's uh, <laughs> a scary feeling. I like how he's turned this into kind of an, an ominous, almost dark place. You know, you're, you're safe, but you're not completely safe. It's slightly ambiguous. Well, it's physically safe, but it's psychologically unsettling. So yeah. you sort of, you, you can't get comfortable somewhere in your soul. Yeah. When I read this sequence in the book, um, it's it's an elf paradise that they're so grateful. It's like the 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 jeopardy is completely taken away, and they're and they're able to relax and be nourished and comforted. And I, I just remember Peter describing that he thought that in the movie, it 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 would totally uh, undermine the kind of the conflict of the and the drama of the story. And so he wanted it to be a totally he he wanted to push into a different kind of intensity what what the Rivendell. Elf experience was for him, and I, and I, I didn't really understand. I didn't really get what he was going for. It's, it seemed until I saw it, and uh, I, I, I just think it's an awesome. It just shows his vision as a filmmaker and his sense of the audience and their experiencing of a, of, a, of the movie. Mm -hmm. Well, what, what's good is everyone gets the moments of intimacy and stillness, which which Peter was great with, you know, because he's got all that the action stuff, which is just fantastic, but. He's still allowed the characters to breathe and to be, to have these moments of intimacy. 
which tell you a hell of a lot about these 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 guys. I remember when we got our first um, had our first tour of Weta, and we're looking at some of the illustrations of how they're going to be creating the different wor- the different places, and we saw um, Alan Lee's first illustrations of Lothlorien, and then they showed us the mi- and then we walked from that room into the room where they had created the miniatures for Lothlorien, and it just absolutely took my breath away. It was the cool. It was the most imaginative, most spectacular looking place I've ever seen. It's quite a good moment because it gives gives him a chance to get something out of his head and off his chest, you know. And and Aragorn's a, someone who he can talk to, you know. He couldn't really talk to this bat with anyone else, I don't think. But uh, Aragorn's a great listener, and I think he he wants to tell him that there there, there is goodness in men, you know, the, the power of man. We've corrupted things. We are corruptible, and we've caused a lot of trouble in this world. But. Uh, you know, there's also some good things. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of history to him. There's a, you know, and he he brings that with him. You know, he brings a. He's very proud of where he where he's from and and the people he represents. And that's why he, he can be a little obstinate occasionally, and he can't come to terms with other people's ideas and cultures. I think uh, he believes so strongly in his own, because as a as a, as a, as a warrior, and as a as a city that's been under siege. And, He's learned to become practical and realistic and very straightforward. So this is all very new to him and, and slightly disturbing. She's really incredible. Just the posture and the poise, you know, I mean, it's funny, I worked for an incredibly long time on the physicality for Legolas to have the kind of that kind of elven poise and posture and um, strength with a sort of... A, a focused strength in the movement with a sort of lightness. And, you know, she was on set for like eight days and there she is just, <laughs> you know, just pulled it off straight away, you know. Elves can communicate without speech. That's one of the, the qualities they have. This is portrayed, you know, really well through the scenes with um, with Gladiel because obviously she's the high elf, queen elf, you know, she can really um, portray that. Close up shot on the feet. That would have been a maybe two hours in feet instead Probably. of you know just your normal hour and a half. They look great yeah. and and touch ups all day. Yeah. Yep. Which is all always day. a pain in the ass. Yeah. It, it was oftentimes that they would, you would call have for the close ups at the last minute as well. Yeah. yeah. Like late in the day. Oh, by the way, <laughs> those poor girls. When when Elijah's sweaty feet had got to work. <laughs> yeah, important fact for people uh, listening to the DVD commentary that Elijah has the sweatiest of all Hobbit feet. It's true. The glue would come loose by by lunchtime, generally. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I, I had to have my feet reapplied at lunch. It was an amazing thing that our that our bodies and minds went through over the course of 15 yeah. months, and it wasn't like a, a traditional acting experience, you know? I mean, you... You going on four hours sleep or something, or you're, no, you're jumping in and out of a van, going doing a, a scene from this thing and back and forth, and it's new stuff coming at you. So I don't think you should, you, you should feel bad about it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so there are definite parallels all the way through the books. I think it's either Frodo or Sam sees in Galadriel's mirror the enslaved hobbits with houses burning behind them, obviously in the Shire. Hobbiton. They see that in the mirror of Galadriel when they're in Lothlorien. So that, to a certain extent, is shown. I suppose it's more of a possibility than something they're actually going to see, which makes them even more determined that they're going to get rid of the ring so nothing like that does happen. Um, I'm a, I was a Kate Blanchett fan before, and uh, if anything, I was even more a Kate Blanchett fan during and after. Um, she's a she's a, a wonderful woman, a wonderful actress, obviously. Lovely quality, lovely quality. And these scenes are so difficult to do. To get the pace right and the rhythm right is very, very hard. To give that ethereal, other world quality and at the same time maintain pace, very tricky balance. You know. Yeah, I was definitely nervous this day. There's actually a horribly embarrassing backstory to the end of this. There's a moment where the, I was supposed to get kind of emotional and Pete wanted a tear to come out. 
and for the love of God, I couldn't get a tear. And yeah. I was, you know, it was so near crying and nothing would come out. And of course, I'm embarrassed because Kate Blanchett's in front of me kind of being very patient and wonderful and waiting for me. It was, it was terrible. <laughs> I felt awful. Time for a, a tear stick. Oh, <laughs> man. It's, it just shows how, um, how powerful the ring is that... Um, I think that that scene where you see Galadriel, which is pretty amazing, I think, where, where she sort of has that transformation as she gets lured in by the ring and then manages to resist it at the last minute. It really shows the, the kind of the power that the ring has over, you know, even the highest of elves, you know. It just really shows the strength that Frodo has to be able to kind of wear it around his neck, you know. It's pretty, pretty phenomenal. That's right. They, uh, they cut out the bit actually showing her ring, that she's a ring bearer as well, which is something I really loved about this scene. That she too is alone, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah, that connection yeah. that we share, we're both ring bearers, which I, I loved. Which I think helps give him confidence to move on, that this powerful elf is also in the same situation, mm. to a certain degree. Another small fact that just came to me there when I was thinking how good the hair was looking. I think everyone wears a wig in this, don't they? Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's true. They're all wigs. Yeah. Peter Owen and Peter King designed them using real human hair from Russia. Um, found out that they found out that these Russian women had been cutting cutting their hair off and, and trying to sell them to make money for food, and they, so they they started importing it. And, it's uh, the strongest hair as well, mm -hmm. isn't it? I believe he just said uh, elves, so I think they are uh, orcs and elves. Kind of. I think um, well, orcs actually came orcs. from. Um, elves who had been captured by Saruman and tortured okay. to the point that they become orcs. Okay. And then he's mixed orcs and goblins. So that's what he's done. To okay. become um, Urukai. Oh, I see. I think it's so. I think it's a critically important scene to put in there to show why they, what their motivation is. What, who are these? Things. So it's not just sort of oh, yeah. random so baddies in a movie. You know what I mean? They're there for a purpose, and uh, yeah, you know. and they have to get psyched up for war, just like other. You yeah. know. And that war paint is so cool. Does anyone know for a fact exactly how long he was in makeup to become Lurps? Yeah, he had like an eight or nine p.m. call the night before, and then no, he had like a he had like a eleven to twelve midnight, I think. Call, and then, and then, then the seven a.m. set call on yeah. So they were putting makeup on him all through the night, yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah and he couldn't go to the bathroom after so many hours. That's Incredible. right. Incredible. I, I felt so sorry for him, you know, because his makeup took nine hours, because everything had to be glued onto him. Everything. It wasn't a suit, because if you put on a suit, things don't move. It's fairly rigid. But everything was stuck onto him. It took nine hours for a very short scene, which he just, I think, stood behind me on one occasion. And he was wonderfully cheerful about it, Amari. Uh, I, I don't know how, I really don't know how he did it. And he wasn't the only one. Some of the others had to go through hell. Oh, we're getting gifts. The oven. Oh, the gift scenes are back in. Me and Don tried very hard to kiss some of these girls. Yeah, we did. They wouldn't have it. No. May these cloaks help from unfriendly... Oh, Lambas bread. I love Lambas. Here we go. Great scene. Lam I'm going to watch this. <laughs> I, I used to call that my uh, Lambas commercial. Lambas, one small bite is enough to fill the stomach of a full-grown man. <laughs> Obviously, Merry and Pippin have, you know, they've filled their stomachs with Lambo's bread, and I think they both come to the realisation that they think their stomachs are just going to explode within the next hour or so. It's going to be the last hour of their life, you know. Very, very funny. And the great thing about that scene was that we filmed it that way, and then Pete just said, you know, what, what do you think's funny? And we just did, like, three different versions of it. Yeah, that. different ways. Yeah. Billy and Dom... Um, have this great comic timing that they can pull off, you know, and it was like, how can we, They were, you know, there was, it was, I think it worked better there. We actually shot it again as well later um, on the on the river because we wanted to try and make it work later, but it just it wasn't going to play. So um, those two, I mean, it's just so hobbity. Very good. That's, that's great about Pete, isn't it, that once he's kind of got what he wants, then he'll just let you kind of do yeah, your own thing. there's and, a lot of freedom. Yeah, which is great. It makes it a lot of fun to, to work on that. I remember reading this moment in the in the book, and it was like, man, he gets this new bow. He gets a new Lothlorien bow, which is longer and 
more deadly, more accurate. And for Legolas, it must be like when you're a kid and you wake up on Christmas morning and open the packet and you've got like a bicycle. You know, I remember, you know, wanting to try and get that kind of feeling across to this moment. I guess that's one thing that the people who watch the DVD will have an advantage over people who don't watch the DVD and listen to the commentaries that scenes like that. I mean, and I guess if you read the books, you know, but the rope, for example, becomes a, a critical tool in helping Sam and Frodo. Very important, this scene. He is absolutely right about what he says about her, you know, that there is an enchantress in the woods. Once the spell is cast, you know, you're never the same again. I mean, he sees her and, and he falls completely, I think, in love with her. It is, a, it is a phenomenon that can happen. I remember once when I was a very young man, I was at university actually, and, and uh, who was that breathtaking woman? Julie Christie. Julie Christie had, uh, was just about to come out in a film called Billy Liar, where she just exploded. Uh, as a, a you know a fully launched film star, and she had that incandescent beauty. I mean, you want to turn away from it. It is it is so beautiful. She made our throats dry. She just made us almost feel ashamed of our ugliness in the presence of such beauty. Only time in my life that I've ever experienced quite that feeling an intensity and a beauty there that uh, that you could that was almost unbearable and that is exactly what uh, you know what the writer is talking about here you know this this the queen of the light is or the or uh, I mean, she is a queen i suppose her her own integrity her own purity and all that sort of thing and even that can be challenged and corrupted by the ring and she wants to know whether that is true or not the ring interferes in its own way most strongly, I think, with those who really possess power. You know, it's kind of the change in Gimli. He starts to see that there are other breeds of people out there that can be mm. influential in his life. Yeah. Mm. Great theme that goes through the story, isn't it? Yeah. Nice colour of Racial the tolerance? Yeah. Yeah, it is. The... the, the Legolas, Gimli. Oh God, yeah, two races that couldn't hate each other more, mm. and how they can become the, the greatest of friends. And become an example to the, you know, to their people that it, that it can happen, that they can become. Mm -hmm. it. It's so, like talking single-handedly shows people how they can develop better relationships with each other. What was? Mm -hmm. So all those months of kayak training, and we we don't even get given an oar. We just, <laughs> Sean Bean drove our boat. <laughs> but it was a laugh in the training, though. That was great. We, um, we had some canoeing lessons, yeah. But, uh, once you got the hang of it, it was quite good. Because <laughs> we had to look as though we were really in command, you know, and we can row, we've done this all. But me and Orlando, yeah, we used to have a bit of a laugh because we used to try and push the oar out and try and move his boat so it went in the wrong direction. He'd be trying to push mine in the wrong direction, all that. It's, uh... <laughs> Part of the kind of bonding process was we um, was, you know, up, along with the sort of training, you know, we had paddle training and I did archery and horse riding and everything else. But um, the paddle training was, was great because it was a it was just we did that as a fellowship, you know, so it was all of us in the boats sort of messing around on the river, as it were. I think somebody went under. I don't, I don't know who it was. Or, um... The book, one of the books, capsized. Didn't Orlando accidentally fall out on the Quarra River? Yeah. Well, <laughs> it, it is true that in our first canoeing exercise, um, the elf and the dwarf um, sank, much to the amusement <laughs> of everybody else. Orlando was a terrible kayaker. <laughs> <laughs> what can you say about the guy who can do everything? Well, he couldn't kayak. Well, way way back from uh, from when we rehearsed in, in kayaking, uh, with with John Reese davies in the boat and Orlando looked at us and yelled out so we could see his special move. How, how, how well he was doing it, yeah. Yep. And then John leaned to the left and that was all she wrote for them. <laughs> Capsized. Out. Don't row into the wind, boys. <laughs> oh! <laughs> the look on his face of just resigning to the fact that he was going down was And the two fantastic. of it, it made the two of them feel kind of antagonistic to each other for about three weeks, which mm. was perfect for their character. But it was good. We looked look quite professional, I think. <laughs> This scene, it was shot in a studio, 
um, with some sort of silver paper on the floor and with light shining on it so it makes us look like the waves that we were inside for this. My mother refuses to let me tell her anything about how things were done. I don't I think say, that's good. Some, she, yeah, I know. Someone will be near us and they'll say, well, how did you make it look small? And she'll just put her hands over ears and go, no, 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 no. It's real, it's real, it's real. I want to believe. <laughs> I think it's the... Things have come to a, a head and uh, this time. the fact that Boromir thinks that Aragorn cares more for for the elves or for his other way of life than than than, than the human side, you know, and he says there, there is honour to be found in men. There's goodness, OK, we've, you know, we've caused some bad things in the world, but we're not uh, unsavable. I think it's inevitable that some kind of disagreement was going to happen between these two characters, some sort of conflict, because it's been bubbling up all along. Yes, there is weakness. I think it's the conflict between him, how he feels about Aragorn's sort of double, his elf, human thing, that he's, he's getting it imbalanced and uh, not giving any dignity to the, to the world of men. And I think he just has to come out. And uh, they don't seem they're going to talk for a few days. <laughs> But it's something that's, that's, that needs to have been said, you know. It's something that's been, you know, simmering for a long time. The, the, this, this sort of, they've got great respect for each other, but you know, they also disagree on, on certain things. And but Boromir is certainly learning to respect Aragorn for what he is now, uh, you know. And uh, it's a relationship that's, even though they're arguing, that, that is strengthening. Mm. No. From hardly uh, acknowledging him at the beginning, he's gone from, you know, he's almost saying, you should be that saviour, you should be the king. And certainly by the end, that's the intention. I love it as you close in on these, that you see the birds sort of flying around the eyes as if they're nesting in there. It just There's little details within this movie that just, I think if you see, yeah, they come out of here. And on the big screen, you can kind of see them come out of the eye as if they've been nesting in the eye. It's those details that I think really make this movie so sort of special and spectacular, you know, the attention to detail. We are so lucky with our audience because um, when you translate something like this, a wonderful and, and, and highly regarded book into film, People know that stuff has got to go. Our audience actually accepts what has gone because they're so happy and satisfied with the rest of, uh, of what they've got and what they've been shown. And I've heard no real criticism about what's been left out. We have such a sophisticated audience that, you know, you haven't, I, have, I have not met one single moment of that intransigence that comes, you know, when people say, well, of course, the film's bloody rubbish because it hasn't got this in it. You know, and you can't tell the story without this. I've not met one mutter like that. I mean, we, we are so privileged in the, in the intelligence and forbearance of our, of our audience. It is astonishing. That location um, was phenomenally beautiful as well actually by the lake there um, the only annoying thing about it was the sand flies they have these horrible insects sand flies in New Zealand my god they draw blood when they bite you and then you just get a huge thing and it's just like ugh. so we were constantly covered in an in insect repellent <laughs> yeah we don't, we don't have we don't have that many scenes together me and Frodo but I mean this is a this is a good one and we just let it play. I think Peter just wanted to see how far we could go and we, we just sort of acted it out. Uh, we didn't use many effects and tried to do it in one go, you know, and we really did it a few times and we got it. None of us should wander alone. But um, it was good just to act a whole scene right through without stopping for <laughs> to put in doubles or special effects and stuff. At this point, Billy and I were uh, filming 
a, on a separate unit with Barry Osborne That's right. directing. Yeah. And we, there was lots of um, Merry and Pippin chasing and uh, fooling the Urukai and, and running in different directions, which was really good fun, wasn't it? Yeah, it was good fun. Very physical stuff, so we jump right in. It's one of the facts of filming the movie that I don't think can be really clearly understood by anybody who wasn't there, but that is a huge... It couldn't have been done without it, is the idea that there were at any given time there were up to six different crews mm. filming the movie at any one time. So they, I think they had 24 motion picture cameras, and, uh, you know, there were two second unit directors, an insert unit director, a model photographer, uh, I mean, just all... And Peter would bounce around kind of you know, helping shape and guide the direction that each unit was going in. But I think one of his biggest accomplishments was helping direct all of these sub-directors. Yeah, yeah. Through, um, he had a, a monitor for each unit, didn't he? And mm -hmm. he'd, he'd be sitting there in front of all these monitors watching shots and... They were being satellite yes transmitted no. and he'd yeah. get on the cell phone and call somebody down in the South Island and say, listen, can you have them move a little to the left? Yeah, amazing. Interesting how that there's no scale trick with that shot. Yeah, but it works. It yeah. does. I love it. After this, he, you know, Peter would say cut and, and <laughs> Sean would go back into being very quiet and kind of composed and mm. soft-spoken yeah. and then suddenly into this, you know, raging kind of emotional scene. It was amazing to watch him click on and off. Yeah, it's incredible, isn't it? Yeah, unbelievable. He, he's just appalled and ashamed of... of of what he's just done. He can't believe that this has happened. Uh, and it's tragic, it's, it's just sort of, this is a good man, you know, and he, he, he could be good, and there's just this thing has got hold of him, and there's no way back for him, it seems. It's, uh, it's inevitable what happens to him. Pretty cool for you, Elijah, that you get, you know, you interact with every major performer who comes there and, and at some certain point you get to go and film a scene individually with them and you uh, it's it's amazing all the different kind of emotional levels that you strike with each different person yeah it's cool and technically how different all those performances are it was just a pleasure for me to be able to to be able to have individual scenes with those people as yeah. well my god what a treat i loved working with him He's such a natural talent and such a, a wonderful uh, energy and his instincts are excellent. And all that wonderful self-belief and assurance that young actors must have if they're going to be good. This is great. This is Vigo really coming into his own here. Mm. I love it. Would you Vigo is such a committed actor. I mean, he just went there with his whole body and soul every day. Mm. I love that the ring actually speaks to Vigo in this and tempts him. Bless us. That's amazing. I didn't pick that up until the third time I saw the movie. Mm -hmm. It's cool how you, with each person who has an interaction with the ring, that when it's in your possession, you're you're just sort of witness of you know of the ring's power on other, on people. other people. Yeah, its effect on other people. That does slowly change though, or quickly change Especially throughout the the longer you have the ring. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I say that to fans like at book signings and stuff when they come up and they've got a ring you know hanging around their neck while you're signing a book or something. I'm like, careful, don't hold that for too long. <laughs> <laughs> I like the little nuance that, that Vigo does where he where he kind of blesses the sword against his forehead before oh, starting the battle. It's kind of that if he does this little motion here that he will not come to any harm, you know. Mm -hmm. And that kind of look at that little glimmer, that shine in his eye just there when he came around the corner in slow motion and you just get this sense like, you know, okay, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> that, now that's what I can say about Vigo that's great. Now, what we could say about him that might be slightly more um, critical is that the stunt guys were terribly afraid of him because he was so into it that he would occasionally hurt them oh, <laughs> with, his, with his sword blade, knocking out their teeth. He got his own tooth knocked out. I wouldn't like to fight him in real life. The maniac. <laughs> that was a sequence I had uh, dragging the arrow out, stabbing him in the face, and then pulling it out to shoot the guy behind. Um, 
I just had that idea to, uh, I was trying to think of cool things to do, you know, because it's like the bow is great for long, you know, the long range and stuff and it looks really cool, but I wanted to get something where it was a bit more close combat. So I thought, okay, well I could use, how could I use an arrow as a weapon aside from just as an arrow, you know? <laughs> I couldn't believe it when it made the movie, it was great. He's the coolest. Oh. I'm so jealous. I wish I could do that with a bow and arrow. This is um, one of my favorite m moments between uh, Oh man, I love this. Mm, this is great. This kind of came out of improvising. Because well, they hadn't really dealt in the ad in the screenplay adaptation with what happens to you two at the end of it. This mm. ending of the film would would not nearly be the same without this. Uh, they hadn't addressed the fact that that to a certain extent, Mary and Pippin make that decision for Frodo. You know, say to Frodo, "Go." You know, we we'll, we will distract the Urukai for you, which was a really great touch, I think. Well, it keeps our connection alive because, in some ways, that was. Forgotten about to a certain degree. This was great fun, wasn't it, Bill? Yeah. <laughs> Although slightly <laughs> scary. Run, running away from all our stunt guy friends. We'd choreograph each scene, each fight scene, and then really it would just all adapt itself. Bob Anderson was the uh, stunt guy, the main. He's the one who was responsible for the chore choreography and uh, and the moves, and uh, he was just great to work with. Uh, as as everyone, I mean, the, the the stunt guys and the stunt girls, you know, they were they were fantastic. They were so precise, so committed and professional about how they did everything. Um, and it was great fun, you know, we had some good times. Yeah, it's nothing more exciting than sort of getting a sword and a shield and being told to go out and fight some orcs. <laughs> unbelievable. And Orly actually did all of that himself. <laughs> that was unbelievable. With I think, the he, did, of some I think he did that himself. Yeah, that was, it was mine. It was not... totally mine. Those are CG arrows. <laughs> Just trying to make him look good, guys. Come he on. looks good. He looks good. He couldn't look any better. He couldn't. Source of great annoyance to me. <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't talk about the outtakes with him at uh, Elm Street. <laughs> <laughs> See, now I wasn't going to go there. <laughs> Sorry. Finally, the horn. Oh, here's the new Aragorn stuff. Oh. Oh. Nice work, Ooh. Fantastic. Just continually oh, running, running, running. Oh, sweet, Vigo. Yeah. Now, here I think there's going to be some stuff of, yeah, oh, Mary and Pippin really good. Nice. Because this, is, this is, could have been their final stand, you know. Actually, um, Richard, who was a cameraman on that day, um, everyone had to wear um, hard hats because the stones weren't real, but they had to have a stone in the middle of the sponge. And as I was throwing them with Dom, he was saying, throw them a bit closer to camera. And I threw it so close to camera, it hit him right in the bridge of his nose. Broke his nose. Yeah. yeah. I bought him a bottle of whiskey for that. With the arrows, we never, nobody ever fired any at me. We just put them in. And on action, I just reacted to, uh, to the arrows. And then, they're, they're horrible, aren't they? Big lumps of wood with hairy tips and very brutal. This walk down the hill, I always, I always see this in the movie, and I'm like, it's just this arrogance, this kind of, the evil of him just oozes out as he sort of strides down the hill and kills our hero. You know, it's pretty, um, pretty powerful. And then Sean Bean, just, oh, man, what a death scene! Amazing. And I think at this point he feels as though he's let them down. You know, Mary and Pippin. And and so it gives it one last go. Brilliant. It was great doing this sequence with Sean Bain. He's amazing. And how he keeps fighting is incredible. Yeah. I just love the slow motion and the, and the way the, the soundtrack emotionally draws you. Oh. And there's a sort of silence. There's a, a, all this battle and then all of a sudden there's a silence that you can, it's, you know, you can almost feel it. Their faces, these two Hobbit, you know, it just sums it up, doesn't it, really? It's pretty amazing that, um, the way they scream off, you know, just... It's great how they just all ignore him now. Mm. No, you, I mean, you know, as an actor, you couldn't wish for a better, I don't know, a better ending, a better way to die. And there's the way he shot it, and the, the sort of weight that he gave it is, uh, it's fantastic. And it makes an impact, you know, I mean, that's, that's, that's what I'm trying to say. He doesn't just... He dies nobly, he dies tragically. 
I remember Vigo and Lawrence had a huge physical fight here and, and uh, didn't really pull too many punches. Vigo was, well, both of them were covered in bruises and I think Lawrence actually does connect when he headbutts Vigo. Oh, may have smacked him there as well. But he definitely caught him then. <laughs> wow. Yeah, because he couldn't tell depth perception because his eyes are totally obscured by the yeah. prosthetics and the... And the uh, oh, the knife. Uh, Oh man, I always remember that. Oh, <laughs> that is so gnarly. In every every time I've seen this in the cinema, like with all the audiences, it there's a cheer. cheer. <laughs> Fantastic. Now we we did this quite early on. I mean, maybe we were third of the way through or halfway through, but um, you know, I was doing my death scene, and I had about I've got about another seven months to shoot on the film, <laughs> so it was the first time. It's one of the first scenes we had together, and we were working on it through the night, you know, well into the night, the night before, with Philippa and Fran, and rewriting it and trying to get it right and get the balance right. And so, you know, it was very fresh uh, in our minds when we when we played the scene, and uh, we were improvising to some extent, but it seemed to come over well. And he's a great guy to have by your side in a scene like this. He really is. I mean, it's great to see sort of so-called action heroes with this sort of depth, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> you know? Yeah, oh, completely. I think that's what sets this apart and why it's not simply just a, a fantasy movie. It's mm. That's what Pete's, Pete's always said right from the start, isn't it? Is it's all about being real, everything's got to be real. Yeah. It's funny, not many, not, no matter how many times you see this, it's still heartbreaking. Mm. Vigo, the pathos in Vigo's soul is so pure. Mm -hmm. Here's Orlando with this incredible look in his eyes. Mm. Mm. Like on Dimmerdale, you know, the elves can't really understand grief or, or death because they don't die. You know? There are more? Mm. My captain. It's great. He, Boromir goes full circle, you know, he pledges allegiance My to captain. Aragorn right at the very end. Well, he's become a victor over his his, tempt, his, his addiction, hasn't he? He's, he's finally defeated it. He, I mean, he's paid a heavy price, but it's almost as though the badness has left him, as though it's just left, left, left his body. And he's, he's back to who he was, but, but more, more imaginative, more learned in, uh, in other people's ways of lives and other cultures. He's become a better man, and it's unfortunate that he, he's not going to be able to prove that anymore. I love John Rhys Davies too, because he's, whether it's in Moria when he's sort of crying because of the, the, the death of his, forefa his forefathers or whatever, yeah. or if he's in, uh, or right there where the dwarves, you know, they've, they've battled, they lost, they've sort of, they're at the other end of the spectrum from the mm -hmm. elves, and that sort of, that resigned sense of knowingness that, okay, we've lost another good soul in the, while fighting the good fight. I mean, it's just... Yeah, you know, yeah. All right, do you remember when they showed us the scene written for the first time? Well, we went out with Pete. I mean, there was, there was so much of the time when Pete, you know, I don't know where he ate dinner, if he ate dinner, if he slept or whatever, but this night it was like, okay, we're all going out to dinner together, Pete and Fran and Philippa and you and me, and we sat in this little thing, and we had a glass of red wine, we had some pasta or whatever, and Fran and Philippa pulled out these two pages, and they handed a, a copy to you and a copy to me. Pete had already approved it or whatever. And it was, this was, you know, a, 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 after a year of filming. And it was like so, I was so gratified. I was so grateful because it was exactly what you, you sort of intuitively wanted to see but that hadn't, they hadn't realized yet. It was almost like they needed to go through the whole filmmaking process and, and really chart what happens with Gandalf and, and, and Frodo and... I just it shows you with the difficult task of adapting these these books and keeping the story straight and the theme straight and you know but the water I mean just describe how cold the water was I mean it's the coldest when I mean, you're in the water for like a minute or, or 30 seconds and it feel you feel like you're I mean everything goes numb everything goes numb I it got took to me about an hour to to warm up same for, probably longer for you because you I, were in longer I got to the point where when you know it, how did they do that were you did they say action? You went under and yeah. then you came back up? Yeah, and, and, you know, I mean, it was hard to submerge yourself. Your body was so cold that when I was trying to run in, 
my body literally stopped and my brain was saying, go run in. I'm they said action. It's time to do it. And my body refused to do what my brain was telling it because it had the sense memory from the, the previous half hour of knowing how cold it was going to be and trying to fully submerge my body. It just would, it was like, oh, I, I, my heart went out to you. That was so hard, man. Nice. It's kind of cool as yeah. well that the underwater sequence here uh, of you—the shots of underwater. Yeah, was um. Dry for wet. Dry for wet. On a stage. On a, on a blue against a blue screen. No water involved. It, it, <laughs> Standing straight up, miming that you're driving with fans. Fans blowing, yeah. and and slow motion. Yeah. So unbelievable. It's so amazing. hard to do and and, and computer generated bubbles coming out of you. Yeah. Your <laughs> and I was so terrified that it would just look crummy that they did a great job. They really did. I didn't even know that it was computer generated until someone told me about three movies mm -hmm. in. I kind of saw it as a Peter and Fran moment because of their sensibility and their whole family thing, you know, as well with Katie and Billy. It's kind of it's almost like how I see them, you know what I mean, in a way. We've all we've all always always said how um, we think you know you know Pete's this Hobbit and stuff. I think Pete's he's got you know the heart of a Hobbit, and but but that that moment I don't know they're so they're just such a great team Peter and Fran. You can really sense that it's a family thing I think as well. You know used to I used to go we, when we go around there for script meetings or whatever and there'd be you know Pete and Fran and Billy and Katie and it was just a I don't know. A moment. That's a nice touch that you don't really see. That he's, that Aragorn takes Boromir's gauntlets. And... Yeah, this is where he puts my gloves on. It's something to remember me by. Uh, but I, I don't think many people really notice it that much. But it's there, and uh, it was Vigo's idea. And it's a great, it's a really nice touch. And I think he wears them for much of the other films. But uh, it's almost as though I've passed something on to him and. Like I am, I am a victor in some ways. I've let it go. I've passed the baton. I've passed the torch to, to Aragorn, and they they will go on. It's a great. It's such a hard thing for them to do to come up with an ending that is satisfying. It makes people in the audience feel like but yet we've continues. seen a whole movie, but uh, but lets you know that you've you know you know it's a you know it's a to be continued. I love though that so many people have come up to me and they're like. Man, I was so bummed when it was over. It was three hours, but I wanted it to keep going. But there is a cap. I mean, the cap is the the end of the fellowship. That is the yeah, cap. Yeah, yeah. And that these pe they will go on. They will find Merry and Pippin, and Frodo and Sam will go off on their own, and there's that kind of knowledge that that's going to take place. Funny thing is that um, that scene, that shot at the end there, where you see me sort of smirk a little as we run off, um, that was... Um, <laughs> We shot that uh, on a on a. I, I, I'd come back out to do some ADR, so we reshot that moment. I think that just just that one shot. So it's funny when I see it in the movie because obviously you know it looks like like it all plays in the same place. It's funny how much stuff you can mix and match up. But um... it's funny you're told your whole life that you're not supposed to talk during movies. Yeah, I know it's very difficult. It's basically in kind of emotional parts. Isn't it, isn't it weird? Where was this film, guys? That was in uh, a parking lot uh, on Rio Pay. Mount Rupehu, right next to the volcano. Parking lot. And then when it comes around for this section, that yeah. was blue screen on a stage in Wellington. <laughs> a year and a half later. Yeah, I, I think it was it was quite a, a ways later than that. It's incredible, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Pieces, little pieces to the puzzle. Look at that bag that Sean had to carry oh, every man. day. Poems. It was so hard. And, uh, you what? finally did get rid of it, but not for a very long time. The whole movie. Peter Jackson and, and, and his team are uh, enthusiasts for film. They want nothing more than to be allowed to make film. They're not after making money. They're not after making reputation. And it's because of that simple uh, enthusiasm and, uh, uh, and honesty that they were the right people to bring off this uh, remarkably difficult uh, task of, of translating a, a great novel uh, into a great piece of cinema. It would have been enough satisfaction to have been uh, in their company and accepted by them and uh, to say um, playing Gandalf was 
the most rewarding job I've ever had. That the world should have accepted uh, the work and uh, cherished it and, uh, and, and be longing for more, uh, it's an incidental, uh, unbelievable uh, fact that um, I've been uh, close to the center of, of some of the most remarkable filmmaking ever achieved. But it couldn't have been achieved if it hadn't been for New Zealand and uh, the shared spirit of people who uh, uh, were born uh, and, and thrived there. Peter Fran and Philippa must have known and dreamt about this. The, the scale of, of, of this achievement or what they could achieve. I, I really do lay claim to being the first on the set who actually was publicly saying, guys, we are making a masterpiece. We're making a film that's going to be bigger than Star Wars. We're going to be making one of the most successful films of the year, if not the most successful film of the year. And in 20 years' time, when people look back, they're going to look on our work and say, one of my top 10 experiences in the cinema of all time. I still believe that. Uh, in fact, I grow more and more convinced of it every day and with every frame that I, that I see of part two and part three. So I can't wait to get back to New Zealand and talk to those press guys and say, now, wait a minute, who was that guy that got up? I can't remember what he said. He, didn't he say something about raise your expectations upwards? What was his name? I, I can't remember his name. He was a tall fellow, I know that. English or British, and clearly, and uh, a little bit robust. And I think he was playing, oh, was it me? <laughs> and I would, I would go around and I would sit and have coffee in tea shops in Greytown or... Um, or Auckland or somewhere down south, you know, and I, and, and I would talk to the, the shopkeeper and the coffee shop owner and I would say, you know, this guy Peter Jackson, he's going to do more for New Zealand than, and for New Zealand tourism than anyone since Captain Cook. I mean, you ought to be giving this guy a knighthood. I've never worked on anything quite like it and I don't know if I ever will. I mean... A year is such, it's a long time, and it went so fast, you know, it was such an adventure. Um, everything, every day something new would be happening, new challenges, and uh, it's a bit like watching the film, it seems to go so fast, it's three hours long, and you, you, there's always something happening, there's always some new adventure. And that's what it felt like doing, working in New Zealand, just like a, a flash of images, you know, and great memories. I don't think I've ever seen such complete cooperation and dedication between cast and crew. I found that on Sleepy Hollow with Tim Burton. I certainly found it with George Lucas on the Star Wars film. I don't think I've ever seen it to such an extent as I did on The Fellowship of the Ring. The complete collaboration, the friendship that existed and respect between the cast and the crew for what each side of the camera was doing. And that's quite unlike anything I think I've ever experienced. I don't think I've ever seen credits as long as this. It's a global, um, it's, it's a, a it's global a, effort. I mean, in, in a lot of ways, it's a it's a project of national identity for New Zealand. But um, I mean, it's a British story, and there's there's British actors and American actors and American talent and Australian, Australian talent yeah. and, and New Zealand talent and people Indian Thai talent, French Canadian, French Canadian, <laughs> I mean, people, from, people from all a over the world, Roid. South African. I mean, there's there's uh, it represents, I mean, I, I used, I, what I felt like when we were making the movie is what I sort of imagined that people in Egypt felt like when they were making the pyramids. That, you know, for a period of time, people came together and ate, slept, worked, and um, lived together while working on a project of, uh, of immense sort of personal importance that would stand the test of time. And that's what I felt like we were doing when we but were down in New Zealand making Lord of the Rings. Luckily, we went sleeves. Well, there's some discussion about whether they were slaves or not. Has there? Dr. Zahi Hawass, who is the head of the Giza Foundation, was one of my professors at UCLA when I took Egyptology, and he discovered a place where uh, workmen were buried, and he believes that the Egyptians, while they may have been technically slaves, were totally involved and inspired by what they were doing, and, and, and that the, his 
thesis is that uh, that the the pyramids couldn't have been created if they if everybody didn't want them to be created. Really? Yeah. That's pretty fascinating. Thanks very much for listening to us while we spoke about the movie for what feels like a few days. Was yeah. it? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. That that was uh, that was an an extended version of the movie that. Uh, <laughs> As, as, as Elijah said, it's just like, um, you know, you're always told never to speak during movies, and I hate being in a theatre when people are talking, so it's very hard to speak about it, but um, it's been really good fun, actually. Yeah, yeah I, ho- fun. I hope we've been entertaining enough. Uh, yeah. I hope uh, you learnt not, some not things you didn't know. Uh, and, and we'll be back next year to uh, do commentary for the for the two towers so um as a note this is actually it, this is sorry to interrupt but no, this is okay. three of us uh our first time doing commentary mr Aston has done commentary before but ah, you all did this is well. a pretty special moment <laughs> no it's yeah, cool. it's cool. knowing knowing for the audience to know that um that you elijah and dom and billy are all such huge fans of all dvds and dvd commentaries and, dvd and, freaks and now you're uh, you've been so, baptized into the culture and and uh and they want to you know people really want seem to genuinely want to know yeah, more right. about how we feel i mean i i didn't know whether we should be talking more about sort of acting or the experience or whatever but hopefully i mean i think it was sort of an honest I th- yeah i think the thing is like like hopefully the movie is it's a kind of um you know whatever you think about it it's a, it's an honest telling as far as we are concerned you know mm-hmm. it's and um, we just had an honest four hours, mm-hmm. four mm-hmm. friends just talking about the movie. Yeah, it was. A, it's yeah. a different. Well, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, if you have any opinions, you should, uh, you know, send them over to. Uh, oh, I don't know where. Did Orlando Bloom <laughs> 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 dot com. www.thelordofthering dot dot net. Yeah, yeah. that's the official one. And you know, let us know. What apologies you think. for any crimes against Tolkien during our. Uh, during our session, because uh, I think I think we all know uh, the book quite well now. So mm, any inaccuracies was probably due to the copious amounts of alcohol that we've. Been <laughs> I was just going to say that uh, I wanted to, to send a, a shout out to uh, Tom Bombadil because yeah. yeah. he was he's, not included. We love you, Tom. Thanks for taking we care of us. Thanks. For and also, me. and uh, all the guys who are making the DVD. Thanks very much. Yeah. Although, is it really, really necessary for us to be naked during this? Yeah. <laughs> because I'm getting quite cold. Thank you. 